Hey, good afternoon. I knew that ring would come in handy for some reason, huh? <laughs> well, welcome, please. We have extra seats, too, if you want to sit around the table. But I want to uh, officially welcome you to uh, our meeting. I know s several of our bodies have uh, new members. Uh, so this is a perfect opportunity for us to try to get together and uh, talk about some issues that impact the entire region. Uh, we do have uh, you know agenda in front of us. I understand that we might not know each other as far as by name. We are not going to spend 20 minutes going around the room introducing ourselves. So what I would do is, as we make our way down the agenda, if you would like to speak or have a comment, please state your name and where you're from just so that we can go ahead and uh, recognize you and what organization you're with. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have some pretty aggressive issues on this issue that on on the agenda that we want to talk about. So, I know, and welcome, Mayor. Oh, thank you. Okay. Let's start off with um, item number two. And where is Mr. Rose? Is he, he is here. Right there. there he is. Okay. And actually, Mr. Waller, Commissioner Waller, are you heading up item two, or is, is Dave Rose going to orchestrate? How do we want to do that with the I-20? I'll do item two. No. Take 20 oh. I got it. <laughs> But I need an agenda. Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't. I got. I got one now. Well, Merv just gave me. What well, we? So <laughs> I gave you. Really you keep money. Oh, <laughs> we were sharing. <laughs> right, Jim? This is my. Yeah, it was. It was a tape. Thing. Come on. <laughs> I got the mic. This is very dangerous. Very dangerous. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to recognize Commissioner Waller to talk about the I-25 gap. And do you want me to do it from here or go up there? Whatever works What's for you. Best. We don't have a PowerPoint. I guess if we don't have a PowerPoint, I'll stay here. Even. I will. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, welcome, Councilman uh, Scorman. I just want you to know we all had uh, 20 minutes to introduce ourselves, but since you weren't here, uh, you don't get that time. So, no. I'm... You know, I, I, I uh, speak so much, I just put myself to sleep. <laughs> I've heard the same about myself. Um, so, uh, the, Thank you all for being here. I, I, what, what a great opportunity. I'm actually supposed to be uh, up in Castle Rock right now at a GAP Coalition meeting, but I thought this was more important today to be a part of. I mean, when, when do we have the opportunity to get not only the city and county leaders together, but um, leaders from our other municipalities as well? Uh, I, I think we all understand and recognize uh, I-25 um, between Castle Rock and Monument is a serious issue for our entire community, not just uh, those of us in the county or the city, but for representatives from Monument, Green Mountain Falls, all of the municipalities. This is something that we are all concerned about. And so we're working on a plan to move this project in the right direction. Uh, and, and in particular, one of the, the things I'm working on this year is trying to find a way to, to develop a little bit of local money to get to solving this uh, gap problem. You know, it seems to me that this is, uh, should be an issue of statewide and federal concern, but it's not getting done at those levels. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as uh, local leaders to take the bull by the horns and make sure we're doing what we need to do in order to move this project in the right direction. That means developing some local money. We've come up with an idea. Um, that we have a, a local RTA board and tax, uh, you know, 1% goes to funding uh, roads and bridges, 
but there's a specifically identified list that that RTA money has to go to. Um, and the RTA has done a, an, an absolutely fabulous job, uh, I think, being incredibly judicious with that money uh, as it relates to doing what they promised the taxpayers that we would do. Uh, surprisingly, though, I-25 is not one of the approved projects on the RTA list. And I'm working on a ballot proposal to, to try to make that happen. Uh, the RTA list um, you know, includes many different projects, but again, I-25 isn't one of them. Currently this year, the RTA's budget is about $89 million. Right now, today, they're really sitting at about $101 million uh, in the RTA budget. So I would like to take a portion of those dollars and be able to apply that to uh, I-25. Apply that as some federal money to make sure we're doing our part to get this gap fixed. Uh, and then in addition to some RTA money, maybe then the county could put some money forward as well to be able to make this happen. But, but what does that mean? What do we have to do in order to, to be successful that way? We have to, um, are we gonna actually have a PowerPoint cool. now? <laughs> All right, I'll probably be done by the time that gets out. <laughs> come in front of you. So, uh, so I guess actually, let's start here. What is the gap? And if we get this up, I'm on, I think, like page three. It, it's that section again, I-25 I between uh, Castle Rock and Monument. It's about a 17, 18 mile stretch, only 10% of which is in El Paso County. Um, we, we need to do this for obvious reasons. I think one, it's a public safety issue. We've seen several traffic accidents on that road uh, in the last several years, and I think they're only increasing. Two, it's an economic issue. There are a lot of folks that live in northern El Paso County, but uh, work in, in Denver. And the more time they spend on the highway, that's loss in productivity. So public safety issue and an economic issue. Uh, environmental impacts have started on that, uh, and I think we're moving forward that way. Do we have it up? Yep. All right, next slide. It's uh, crucial to, these are some comments from some of us uh, along the way, crucial to expanding, uh, to making it happen. Here's something uh, Congressman Lamborn said about it. It's vital uh, that the section known as the gap is widened and improved, and it's done as soon as possible. Uh, another one, uh, Shaylen Blatt, he's the uh, director of CDOT. Congestion continues to build along I-25. CDOT's decided that this project can't wait. Uh, we're gonna do our part, get it ready for construction in two years. Now we just need to come up with the three to 400 million in order to do it. I think that's where we come in partially. So here's the RTA. The RTA was passed in 2002. Um, one cent sales tax, it expired, uh, it was set to expire in 2014. It was extended to 2024. 55% uh, of the revenues collected go for projects, specified projects. 35% are for maintenance or upkeep of those projects. Actually, it doesn't have to be a project that's on the RTA list. It's just maintenance, upkeep of uh, projects within our jurisdictional boundaries. Um, and again, it passed in uh, 2012. Renewal of it passed with a 80% margin. Uh, and uh, and uh, of the dollars, the other 10% goes to transit. So, so how does this work? There are five member governments of um, the RTA. It's the city of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, uh, Manitou Springs, Green Mountain Falls, and the uh, township of Rama are the five member governments of the RTA. And in order for us to make a, a change to the ballot, we want to put I-25, or, or my goal is to put I-25 on the project list, we have to go to a vote of the people. Uh, how do we do that? We have to get a majority of the RTA board to vote to put it on the ballot, but that's not the end of the conversation, or that's not the end of the effort that we have to engage in. Each member government has to vote to support amending the IGA. So we can get something on the ballot, but that's not enough. We also have to amend the IGA in order to make this happen. And that has to be unanimous approval from each member government. So effectively, each government has a veto power to say, nope, we don't want to put I-25 on the project list. So how do those member governments agree to do this? 
they have to, each member government body has to vote uh, in their body and that has to pass by two thirds in order for then that member to come and support putting this um, on the ballot. So, so effectively, here's what that means. Um, Colorado Springs City Council has to have a two thirds vote or at least six members have to support amending the IGA. Uh, uh, El Paso County Commission, two thirds of the commissioners have to support amending the IGA and so on and so forth. Uh, I think we can get this done. We need to push hard to make this happen uh, for the 2017 ballot, but I think it needs to happen for the two 2017 ballot and it needs to happen now because we have these extra funds that we can work with. And, and quite frankly, that gets us moving a little quicker down the road. Can we explain that slide? Um, here, here are some other sources and ideas for how we can also develop funds. You know, we're, we're, what I'm really looking for here from uh, RTA is about five million bucks. And I think most of us would say, well, geez, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what it's gonna take to get this project done. It's about a 300 to $500 million, million dollar project, of which again, about 10% falls within our jurisdictional boundaries. That means our portion of the project, if you just sort of extrapolate it out based on uh, money, it's about a 30 or $50 million proposition for us. And while I think five million from RTA is a great start, uh, we need to be looking at other sources of local dollars in order to make this happen as well. Uh, I think in the county, one of the things that we're considering, uh, we haven't certainly agreed to this yet, but it's, it's an idea we're kicking around. We're looking at about 15.1, uh, 15.2 million in Tabor excess, and we may go to the voters and ask them to keep a portion of that money, and then a portion of that money that we would keep, uh, we would uh, ask them to put towards this I-25 project as well. Uh, I, I think there's a possibility, you know, one of the ways that this has been accomplished in other parts of Colorado is the addition of toll lanes. That doesn't mean that all of the lanes would be tolled between El Paso, or, you know, in that section of the gap. It means that perhaps we'd add one single tolled lane. So if you're sitting in traffic and you want to bypass it, you could perhaps take the tolled lane. And, and that's a, an idea that helps us raise money. Um, and it, it, at the same time eases congestion along I-25. So that's a, a possible funding source as well. Uh, certainly our Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, I think, is working hard to be a much more active voice. Uh, I know uh, Councilman Pico is, is working hard to be a much greater voice in Denver to, to try to ensure and bring some of those um, CDOT funds and state funds down to make this project happen. And I'm in, encouraged, I think we're moving in a more positive direction that way. Uh, finally, a, another area we're exploring are some public-private partnerships uh, that can help us make that happen as well. Um, you know, I'm, uh, again, I'm asking for your support on this. Uh, I'm gonna be asking council to hopefully put this um, on your agenda in the next month or so because we, and you know, Green Mountain Falls, Manitou as well. Uh, because we have to have this ready for the ballot in September. Uh, any questions? Uh, I'll Go use ahead, this please. one. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Merv Bennett. I'm uh, Colorado Springs City Council, and I'm chair uh, this year of the PPRTA. Mark and I have talked about this at, at length, and one of the things I want to emphasize is, as Mark described, we would be using the additional dollars above and beyond the budgeted amounts. This would not take away money from projects that are already scheduled. This is projects that are over and above. It would not affect Green Mountain Falls uh, because those are already budgeted and uh, this would be additional dollars to go above and beyond. And uh, right now, like you said, we're at 10 to 12 million over just for this year. Um, and so we feel that that opportunity is there and it would be a, a way of going to the voters to identify uh, a good use for these dollars for, for the future. If we did it for two years, if there was potential for overage for two years, we could, we could then come up with 10 million with PPRTA. So I just want to make this clear that, I, I, let me use another example. When, when we started uh, the project in PPRTA on West Colorado, uh, which is affecting 
multiple jurisdictions. In Colorado Springs, um, we needed to take some dollars that we were going to use for um, Centennial Boulevard extension that would connect it to I-25 at Fontanero. But there was some work that needed to be done on a dump that needs to be cleaned out before that construction was done. So we were able to move those dollars over to West Colorado and move that project to 2019. This won't have any effect on that because those are still budgeted dollars. So I just want you to know that none of the projects would be negatively impacted. We'd be using dollars above and beyond what was budgeted. Tom? Mark, I don't think, is this on or not? good. Yep, okay. I don't think anybody in here uh, isn't a proponent and, and a cheerleader for this. 300 to $5 million is, is such a huge amount. Obviously, it, it almost becomes insurmountable. But I, I have two questions about your other sources of funding. Uh, as you know, there's a toll road between Denver and Boulder on 36. Have we got any data as to how much money that's generated, and could we do that to see how one toll lane is worked out to see what that could do? Uh, and I would just suggest we do that. And, and have you had any dialogue with private partnerships that, you know, said that they would step up to some kind of a funding augmentation? Well, I, I'll tell you on um, the 36, uh, no, we don't have that data yet. Uh, and I think the reason for that is it's, you know, it's still fairly new, and I don't know that there's been a tremendous amount of data collected on that. But that's certainly something uh, that we'll look into as we consider, you know, putting a forth a, a, a told idea. And I'm, you know, I'm certainly not married to any of these. Yeah. Um, I, I was just trying to put out there what some of the other suggested sources of revenue might be. Uh, the public-private partnership, yeah, I, I have had some discussions. Um, I think the trick is figuring out how to do that. We think there might be some uh, enterprise zone tax credits that we can work with in order to make that happen. I, I don't think it's a tremendous amount of money, but it's an opportunity for some private partnerships to engage in the process as well. Okay, good, good questions. Uh, yes, yeah, Sharon. Sharon Thompson, Fountain City Council. Um, so if, you, if the Tabor overage does go to the ballot, you're going to have some communities such as Fountain who are not members of the RTA that you're going to be asking to keep their Tabor dollars. So how are they going to be assured that what um, he just explained, moving money around to fund this project instead of that project and put this one off, um, who's going to be their representative to assure that the monies that are coming in from that Tabor refund are kept specifically for that project, if it were to pass, if it mm -hmm. even goes on the ballot, um, so that they can be assured that they're being represented correctly? And who would that representative be? I'm sorry, I don't think I did a very good job of explaining that. I kind of mashed a couple of different pots of money together. So the RTA issue is a distinct and separate issue, and all we would be looking to do there is put um, the, the only ballot initiative that we need to have go forward in terms of RTA is, is it appropriate to use RTA dollars for I-25. That, that's what we need to ask the voters. That's complete and separate uh, and distinct from uh, Tabor overages. Uh, the Tabor overages that I was talking about are actually just El Paso County Tabor dollars. Uh, the county's budget or the, the county's Tabor refund today looks like it's gonna be about 15.1, 15.2 million dollars and so it would be the county that would go to the voters uh, to ask to keep a portion of those Tabor dollars, the county's Tabor dollars, and put those to this I-25 project as well. So you have RTA dollars, five million, and then I think we're looking at about, you know, seven and a half, eight million dollars from the county in addition. Uh, so two, again, two distinct and separate pots of money. If if your town council has some sort of Tabor issue on the ballot, uh, that would be unimpacted by this, if that makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. So the money, if, if the city, county kept the Tabor dollars, would not be commingled with the RTA funds as a flow through pass. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. So uh, Mark, um, Peggy Littleton, El Paso County Commissioner. So 
while we might, you know, come up with the funding through some creative sources, whether through, you know, some ballot initiatives, et cetera, I, I think that begs the question, though, what are we asking our friends and partners to the north of us to do, Douglas County? Because from county line up to, you know, C-470, or up, uh, I'm sorry, county line up to Castle Rock is the continuing gap problem, right? And so it doesn't matter if we get up to county line and all of a sudden we still have a stall through Larkspur and other places uh, that are always a problem. So have you challenged our colleagues? up in Douglas County to do the same or match. So Andy's raising his hand. Do you want to take that, Andy? <laughs> in part. Um, I know you've been involved quite a lot in the, in the gap and so have I, but uh, I just want to touch a little bit on PPACG, uh, Andy Pico City Council, and, and I'm also the uh, chair of PPACG for the moment. Um, we have, in fact, funded a lot of the stuff, a lot of the preliminary work to get this started. Uh, PPACG has taken the, uh, the dollars we have available uh, for various projects, and, and we've helped fund uh, the, the research, the environmental uh, clearance, and, and get this stuff ready to go. We have also worked pretty closely with the uh, Northern uh, MPO as well as uh, Dr. Cog, uh, Denver Region uh, Council of Governments. And uh, they have a different set of priorities, uh, as, as you well know. And we've, you know, we have been butting heads now for quite some time of trying to get them to at least add that to their project list, and they've been reluctant to do so. Their focus is I-70 <coughs> east-west. Um, the northern um, TFR and us, of course, are concerned, and Pueblo are all concerned about getting north-south I-25. Uh, and we running it, and we have been running into a significant roadblock in there, and and that's this uh, that's a tough problem to handle. Uh, but we are continuing to work that. And and I'd put just a little bit of a finer point on that, uh, Peggy. Um, certainly, we've had issues with some members of Dr. Cog and and those that prioritize I-70. But Dr. Cog has broken into was it four or five different transportation regions just within Dr. Cog itself. And I know that our partners in uh, Castle Rock and you know all the municipalities along the corridor are very interested in making sure this project happens. In fact, I'm actually missing a meeting, uh, a, a GAP coalition meeting right now to be here today. And, and I have challenged uh, our, our friends up in Douglas County and some of those members to um, come to the table with local dollars as well, and I, I think that's gonna happen. I think the, the model for this has been uh, the I-25 expansion north of Denver. Uh, all of those municipalities and local governments came together to work hard in order to make that happen, and I think that they did an outstanding job of coming together with those local dollars and then leveraging those to get the state and the federal government to pony up money as well, and, and that's what it's gonna take. I mean, make no mistake, we're not gonna pay for this on our own. But, but we got to come to the table with some skin in the game, and I think once we start doing that, that's when we start getting movement from the other folks. Mr. President? Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to thank you for leading this effort, because uh, I, I, uh, I know you're sticking your neck out, and it's not easy to uh, figure. This is a complicated puzzle, it sounds like. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, and, and so I, I wanted to just ask you what, what you, if you could wave your magic wand, uh, what would you want to see happen uh, in terms of a timeline and, and uh, contribution and, and how you see this moving forward? Because I know uh, all this, uh, we'd like to see it happen tomorrow, but it's going to take a while. You know, I think, I, I'm not sure five years is realistic. I, I think that's what we would all, I mean, that's the absolute, I think, soonest that this thing could happen moving forward. But, but I think at the end of the day, we don't want it to take 10 years. Um, I, I, I think that's, you know, once we're starting to push up against a decade, that's far too long. Um, I, I think if we can make this happen somewhere between that five to 10 year range, I, that, that's an accomplishment that I think we could be proud of. If it goes beyond that, I don't think so. Um, but, but I think as far as our portion goes, you know, and we can only, we can only fund the portions that fall within El Paso County. You know, we can't, our, our RTA dollars can't go to fund uh, portions of this outside of the RTA jurisdictional boundaries. Now, you know, that means, you know, north of the county line. Uh, so, so all we can fund is our portion of it, or all, all we can contribute to is our portion of it. But I think in a couple of years, if the economy continues to grow, I, I think we can effectively come up with that. You know, if our per portion is 30 to 50 million, 
I think we can get awful close to that in local dollars. And I think that shows real commitment from our community. You know, I was talking to a lot of my friends in the state house this year uh, about the need to get this done. They said, well, you know, look, you're, you're not supporting any of these uh, initiatives that are coming forward in the state legislature. You know, why, why would we, why is funding your project so important for us when you're not putting skin in the game? I think what we're doing here is saying, you know, you know what? <clears throat> we figured out ways to do this without having to raise taxes. We figured out ways to come forward with local dollars without having to impact other projects that are moving forward. This is our skin in the game. And I think they got to listen. Yeah, Councilman Murray. Yeah, Councilman Murray, uh, Colorado Springs. I, I, I consistently uh, hear uh, our politicians uh, mistake uh, excess for more. Okay, that there is no excess, there's more funding. Excess means you've already accomplished all your tasks and you have more money. So don't use the term excess. We have more money in the coffers because of a better economy. Now, PPRTA was designed and voted on by our citizens with an A and B list because we recognized the importance of each one of these projects over time, but we didn't have the money for them. We didn't have more. And now you're saying, let's scrap what we've already decided to do. We haven't even finished the A-list as far as I'm aware. Okay, so any more should go back into that A-list, then go to the B-list, because each and every one of these projects are funded by the citizens here. And to su suddenly suggest that I see a shiny object over here, okay, that we should take five million bucks out of this stuff. It's going to come from here, not going to come from somewhere else. So, so this is more funding for local government, local roads, local improvements, and, and it, five million shouldn't even come from PPRTA. Yeah, and Councilman Murray, I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, and maybe I didn't articulate myself correctly. First of all, I'd say uh, I don't think I-25 is a shiny object. Uh, I think it's a real serious need for our community. Um, I think it's a public safety need, and I think it's, uh, it has an economic need as well to get done. So I, don't, I uh, dispute the sh shiny object uh, comment there. But here's what I'm asking, and I, I've heard you say this before. All we want to do is go to a vote of the people, because the people put the list together in the first place, right? The people approved the list. All I'm saying is, let's go ask the people if they want to put I-25 on the list. That's all we're saying. People, do you think this is a real, necessary public safety and economic need? And if you do, is it okay if we put it on the list and use some RTA dollars to fund it? That, that's, that's all we're doing. Uh, Commissioner Littleton. Thanks. And just to add on to that, I can see where you're coming from on that, Councilman Murray. But, you know, even in PPRTA, when I sat on the PPRTA board for five years, you know, there were projects were scoped in, in their size because what we'd anticipated at one point in time of having this huge need during the first 10 years for banning Lewis Ranch and that area to be expanded simply didn't happen because development didn't drive it. And so while we look at this, uh, we're all all we're doing is what Commissioner Waller says, going back saying, should this be added to the list? Because this now has become a very critical need within our community that didn't exist necessarily uh, the, as, as a high ranking uh, need back when it went to the vote of the people. So we are going back to the vote of the people, you know, potentially looking at that and asking them, do you want, is, is this high priority enough that you want to be adding this to the list now? Um, because it impacts your life in a, in a negative or positive way. If I could just make a couple of comments. Um, I do know that uh, the contribution of local dollars did make a difference in uh, the por portions of northern I-25 that have been expanded. Um, and I am not philosophically opposed to asking the voters to spend a portion of what I would call unappropriated money that not currently appropriated to uh, a project. Uh, and I think the amounts that Mark's talking about are fairly reasonable. If we were talking $20, $30 million, I'd be very nervous. But if we're talking $5 million a year, I, I'm not philosophically uh, opposed to that, even though I think most everybody here would join me in the notion that 
uh, we take care of our local roads and the state and federal government takes care of the um, uh, state highways. They haven't stepped up to the plate, but I, uh, I have seen where the locals stepping up to some extent have been enough of encouragement to help the project along. Obviously, our language would have to be permissive. Uh, we're not going to, even if the voters say, yes, you can do it, we're not going to do it unless they come forward with the sufficient amount of money to, to do what has to happen. I got to the, and I'll be very candid about the other concern I have, and that is uh, the crowded ballot. Uh, let's think about it. If the, if the county's asking for Tabor excess, uh, School District 11 is asking for a tax increase. Uh, the city council, uh, depending upon some polling that's going on right now, may well uh, decide to ask for um, a stormwater fee. There were three there. Uh, then this would be a fourth. Um, Lord knows what other um, municipalities may be asking for something. So I can think of about uh, four or five tax issues that are going to be on. And I, every t when I see those, I get a little nervous about, hey, this is way too confusing. No, 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 no. So that, that is a concern I have. But um, I am, in terms of uh, what's structured here, I don't have any philosophical. It'll make it a shorter ballot if the city doesn't put one on. <laughs> well, you know, and, and this is, this is uh, Daryl Glenn, Border County Commissioner. This is why we're having this meeting. Uh, because the one thing I want to do is leave here today with an understanding and a plan on what we're going to do because we want to be working together because if we're going to do that it's going to take all the leaders in this room to be able to speak with the united front on these are the global issues from a strategic standpoint that we need to work on. So as you're giving comments to this, I would like to know from the other municipalities whether or not there's even support to continue this discussion. Because there is a timeline in place in order to be able to get something on the ballot. So if there is not even support in this room to do that, then we essentially move on. But uh, I just want to make sure that we leave here today with a clear understanding and a vision that we're either going to take that as an action item back to our respective bodies and make that happen or we're not going to do that. Why didn't they tell us? <clears throat> See, I think it's already on. It's just on. Okay. <clears throat> I, I appreciate uh, the mayor's comments. I think that's exceptionally insightful about the number of items on the ballot that could be a challenge. Having said that, and not really having a good answer for that specific uh, point, I, I do feel strongly about uh, taking uh, the I-25 gap issue to a ballot. Um, if that is successful, uh, that, that will do several things for our community that I think will be excellent messages to our legislatures, uh, uh, legislature in Denver. First of all, uh, we'll be able to speak with a PPRTA voice, which is a unified voice with several municipalities that are in it. I think that's a very powerful uh, point that we can make there. And there will be an opportunity for our legislators to see a vote that has taken place. And again, if successful, it would be a majority of the voters that that have expressed a sentiment. I, I think um, in working through this, it might help us unify our activity in working with our legislators because we still have challenges about prioritization of funding at the state level that really does need to be addressed. You know, uh, the state, if I understand correctly, has increased its revenues about a billion dollars a year for the last five years or so, and yet we don't seem to have the capacity to put the put substantial chunks of those dollars into infrastructure and transportation. And um, when stuff like this happens, we need to take, take more ownership and take charge and work on a process of influence to, to help them realize that uh, it's important for them to work through that prioritization issue. I see this as a vehicle to help us do that. So I, you know, I, I think I am interested in that going to the ballot um, for the reasons that have been stated before, but also because I think that adds influence uh, and uh, a capacity for us to deal with this better at the state level. Yeah, I just want to touch very briefly on the on the subject of a local match. Um, yes, federal and state uh, should be focusing on federal and state roads, 
But the reality is that if they're going to come in there and do some of those federal and state roads in our local area or something of our interest, we have to put in a local match, and we have done that. Uh, PPACG coordinated all uh, the local match for the Cimarron and uh, Fillmore interchanges, and without that, those projects wouldn't have happened and that money would have gone elsewhere. So it's essentially, you have the local match. The issue, of course, that we have is we're kind of getting in somebody else's jurisdictional bounds, and uh, that's kind of where, you know, we, we bump into uh, some of the bureaucratic uh, hurdles. And, and Andy, I just want to agree with you and let everybody understand that the funding for the Cimarron project came out of PPRTA. And the city. It did. It, it, came from, it came from multiple sources, but the point is we did have a local match without which neither project would have ever happened. Councilman Murray. Again, uh, so I understand what you're suggesting since it's not fleshed out across the spectrum. You want us, to, you're suggesting that we put on the ballot, okay, that $5 million from the PPRTA budget be dedicated and prioritized for the I-25 expansion, and that this $5 million in a $400 million project will be enough to sway our northern neighbors and others to go ahead and pay for it. Uh, we're not even, so we're gonna freeze $5 million for an indefinite period of time. Is that what your suggestion is? No, not at all. Um, in fact, I, I, I don't know, maybe I, again, didn't articulate myself well enough, uh, but, but in addition to RTA money, we're looking at other sources of local money as well. Uh, certainly uh, Tabor refunds or potential Tabor refunds at the county level, putting some of those dollars together as well. Uh, and, and I don't think, I, I think, um, you know, your suggestion would be one way to do it. Um, but I think perhaps the better idea is just to add I-25 uh, to the RTA list and then have an agreement amongst the member governments to just take five million off the top uh, for this year, and you know, and, and perhaps if, if budgets continue to grow, maybe we can look at it in another year as well. But I think what we're asking, you know, what we should be asking the citizens for is just to add it to the list. Can we add a section to it that says that the county will match the five million that we take out of the PPRTA? Because I'm, I'm, I'm watching, I don't see a, a number from the county right now of how much they're matching in these particular funds. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't hear that number when I said it earlier, uh, but I said, uh, you know, I, I think we're looking, what we're looking at from the county is you know, about seven and a half million uh, to eight million dollars this year. And that's a specific commitment by the county of this year if we approve the five million additional. <laughs> Okay, so, so Councilman Murray, we're not approving $5 million. We're not doing that. What we're doing is we're going to the voters to ask the voters to put I-25 on the list. That's what we're doing. Asking to put I-25 on the project list. The two miles that we have responsibility for. Exactly, yes. Well, to, yeah, our jurisdictional portion of it, as I explained mm -hmm. earlier, that's right asking the voters to put that on the list. And then we would look at using the overages or the um, revenue above budget and only a portion of that for this project. I wish you'd give me actual numbers. How much is the county putting in? I, how, I don't know how to Is say it different. Is there a commitment different. by the county for this? Or I, we, I don't know how to say it different. Um, Trustee Stevens. Tyler Stevens, Green Mountain Falls. I think, in my view, this is premature. We're not looking at a specific proposal at this point. The idea and the concept around this table today is, is I-25 widening and the gap important enough for the region to explore options and opportunities? And that's what we're looking at. We're not looking for signatures today. We're looking for, is this important enough to the communities of the region to forward this idea, explore funding options, and figure out how this has all come together? Um, and I think from the Green Mountain Falls standpoint, yes, it's vitally important as well. We're a regional player, and it may not seem like it, but uh, we also 
drive and work and, and transport and get goods throughout the region that are carried on all parts of the road. So it is important for us to be a regional player, and that's why I'm very supportive of this, and I think it's a, one of the many creative ideas that will take place to make this happen as a region, but it takes all of us coming together, deciding that this is a priority, and figuring out how we get it done. This particular project and proposal and idea for the PPRTA is one of many. And how it all comes together, I'm not sure. But unless we take some steps forward and start exploring, we're not going to go anywhere. Because we can't just wait for the signature and the perfect package to come before us to sign. I think, Commissioner Waller, what would help is by putting it on the list, does that guarantee anything it, as it, far as from a dollar amount? Because I think that's what the yeah, issue is. Before. Yeah, and, and no, it doesn't. But, it doesn't guarantee any specific dollar amount. It would just go on the list like other projects. Um, and then it would be up to us, the member governments, to decide what dollar amount to put towards it. And what I've asked is for $5 million. Uh, and, you know, I, um, I don't know that that's the exact number that we end up settling on at the end of the day. But as the mayor said, that's a safe number. I've had the discussion with... Uh, President Scorman, and um, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for him, and I think he wants to say a couple of words, but I, I think it's positive movement in the right direction. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is, and, and uh, you know, really, you think about it, uh, it affects everything in, in our region. Uh, I was just talking to the airport director today. We have all these new nonstop flights. It, wouldn't it be great to be able to get people from uh, Douglas County to come and use our local airport? Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about trying to expand Peterson and other other uh, facilities, and we would love to have the ability for people to get up back and forth to Denver. But but the, it's the uh, the accident rate that uh, I'm the most concerned about, and I think we really have that responsibility to put it on the list. It, it wasn't an issue back when. It really wasn't when we put the RTA, PPRTA together. And Peggy, you're right. Uh, it is now. Uh, let's make it a priority. I, I think uh, certainly there's other council members that could speak for themselves, but I know I would very much like to make this a priority. I guess I'd like to find out if there's a, uh, you know, a municipality or town that has objections so that we could kind of flesh that out and talk about it. Because again, I don't want us to have a meeting just to have a meeting. I want to come away with a plan on, okay, we are actually going to go do some things after this discussion. So if, I'd like to hear from some of the other. Um. <laughs> So I'm not objecting at all. Um, the, the ask was, uh, would I be willing to go back to my council and make it an action item? And I am willing to do that. Um, today is extremely valuable. I think people are raising points that in my five second conversation with you, Commissioner Waller, uh, wasn't able to come up. So this is extremely valuable. July 11th, Manchu Springs City Council is having a work session on a variety of topics that we're considering putting on the ballot as bond issues. So I will just add this to the list um, to at least educate and communicate uh, with my constituents on this, and then I can make it an action item uh, as soon as our insanely long agendas will allow for. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always happy to come and make a presentation if, they, if you think that's helpful. I do think it would be helpful. I'll let you know. And, and any other discussion, and even in the audience, if there are people that want to uh, address this, you can actually come to the microphone on this particular issue. Um, because if we, uh, once we're finished here, we'll move to the next item. But, oh, Deborah. Daryl. Okay. Yolanda. Yeah. Go ahead. Yolanda Avila, uh, District 4. City Council. I'm not really convinced. I always think that our neighbors to the north, whether it be North Colorado Springs or Denver, always overlook the south part. So we want to do a project on I-25 to the north and where we have crumbling bridges and sidewalks and streets in southeast Colorado Springs. And that's never a priority. So. Um, at this point, that cannot be a priority for me when uh, the constituents that live in my area have never been a priority. And I'd like to see if indeed uh, we took this project forward, if there would be some monies from uh, that's not already assigned to other projects could happen in uh, Southeast Colorado Springs and to transit, to transit. We, uh, 
when uh, the county commissioners moved the workforce center over to the northwest side of the city, it made our unemployment rate go up and it hasn't come down like the rest of the city. So I wanna see what kind of commitment you would have to my district, District 4, and to the constituents because our constituents, for the most part, are not seeing that as a priority. Sharon Thompson, City of Fountain. So um, just a comment, it's gonna be extremely important to people that are not part of the RTA to keep this separate. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of misunderstanding, like it was here at the beginning today, about where the funds are gonna go through and who's gonna be responsible for them. I am willing to take it back to Fountain as a discussion item. I have no idea how it will go. Um, of course, we have the same problem with uh, the Peaceful Valley and some other places that need, uh, extremely need some work done to them for citizens that are completely flooded out of their community if, if we have a large downfall. But I am willing to bring it back as a discussion item um, and possibly have uh, one of you guys come down and, and, and that probably wouldn't happen for at least a month though we had a pretty busy agenda. Agenda too. Uh, District Attorney May, did you have a comment? And then I know Deborah, you or were you just stretching? Were you just stretching your arm and just like? No, I was. See, that's what happens if you move like that. <laughs> okay, go ahead, and then you can come. Go ahead. Just what is the deadline? I know I'm pretty clear with the deadline for um, some of our municipal uh, ballot stuff that we're working on. I do need to know that deadline so that I can uh, bust a move on the agenda. Are we prepared from a county attorney standpoint to lay out the agenda? I know we talked about that earlier. Do you remember? I can't remember. The question is when you have to reserve space on the ballot? Well, yeah, when does, yeah, don't we need to basically get the language for the ballot question yeah, to, the, to the county and such by a certain time, yes. right? Well, so I just want to make sure that I don't miss that, and it would be awesome to have that language as soon well, as possible. Correct me if I'm wrong, there's, there's two different, uh, by July 28th, uh, an entity other than the county let, needs to reserve space. And then I think it's September something that you have to have the language determined. And, and we will reserve the place on the ballot for it. So and as, as soon as you have the language, you know, send it my way, it would be much easier for me to communicate with that as well. Because I would imagine people will have similar concerns Absolutely. as Mr. Murphy and Yolanda do. And, and I get where they're coming from, by the way. Oh, I was just trying to get the mic adjusted. <laughs> Oh. That was Nicole Nicoletta from Manitou Springs. Deborah Stout Meininger, community advocate, citizen scientist. What I can say is because of the other things I've been involved in, I have been at a lot of a wide range of meetings. I've talked to a lot of people out east who have concerns about their properties and Highway 24 and all the side roads that are not being worked on and they feel like they're being left out because all of this attention is to Highway 24, sorry, Highway 25 and not 24, not their community roads. I know that down, even in Fountain, we have that feeling, even though we're not part of the PP, uh, the, the RTA package. But we travel from area to area. We have family and friends. We spend money in each and every one of the communities. So we have a vested interest in those tax dollars that we pay for our groceries, for our uh, entertainment, for visiting family, for when they come in, what hotels we ask them to spend in, all of these things. So we're all intertwined, and this is a good idea here, but the community has been balking about just the stormwater fees. They almost didn't want to do the Tabridge overage keeping that because a lot of people were saying, Okay, we're gonna give them this and what are they gonna ask for next? Here's the next. And all for a few miles of road that everybody else, not everybody else, but a lot of people who travel from here to Denver, they're not happy with the accidents, but they're looking at people to be more careful, not to have something that's like California six lane highways where all it is is just being another level of congestion, not an actual solution. And then that'll be millions of dollars down the road again. Every time we ask to keep more money, uh, the government asks to keep more money, 
to spend on something that does not address things on a local basis, people are going to be looking like they are, oh, everybody likes to say, wonderful interchange project. No, a lot of people say interchange I-25 overkill project. That is, to a lot of people, that was so unnecessary. It needed a few adjustments, but it didn't need to be a whole makeover. Not in their mind. So just from a, a, a citizen point of view, from the conversations I've had with people over the last four years, the highways, the private roads, everything comes up as an issue all the time, along with everything else, just to let you know that. Well, and I appreciate that, and I'm sure that once it's taken back to, at to uh, within each municipality, these are the types of discussions that we're going to have. But the, the main point, and I'll have Commissioner Wall wrap this up and we'll move to our next item, is we just need a, an understanding on taking it back and a commitment to at least addressing that with our body. Uh, from what I'm hearing, that the, there is support to at least do that. Uh, and I firmly believe that this is something that's vital to the region. And in my opinion, that if we are able to actually accomplish this and finish this, it's actually going to help stimulate our economy, which we can then reinvest into the, some of the underserved communities. And I know people like, they're tired of hearing that, but the reality is the feedback that we're getting from our people that live here, that that is a big problem that we need to address. So, Commissioner Warren, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you. you know, and, and I would just say the beauty of this proposal is the voters get to decide if this is something that they want to do or not. Um, you put it on the ballot and you let the voters decide if they think that this is an issue worthy of pursuing. I mean, that's all we're asking to happen here. Uh, and, and we're not asking to, uh, to interrupt any other project in the process. Um, we're just simply looking at trying to develop some local money to put some skin in the game to make sure we're doing our part to make this project happen. I'll be happy to come to any other local government to, uh, that's on the RTA board to give this presentation if you think that helps, and if you don't, that's fine too. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Great. Our next item is the Office of Emergency Management, and Dave Rose is going to lead that discussion. All right. Uh, thank you, council, uh, council members, uh, Commissioner uh, Glenn, uh, President Scorman. Mayor Southers, uh, great to have the opportunity to do this. I point out that I am wearing my uh, El Paso County employee pin and my City of Colorado Springs uh, <laughs> Olympic City USA pin as I come before you today. Always the diplomats. <laughs> we try. Uh, this, uh, this subject is, is actually not new. Uh, as we came through the uh, two disastrous fires and subsequent floods uh, from time to time, uh, we would uh, we would be working in the uh, in the county uh, emergency operations center or in the city emergency operations center, uh, standing up uh, joint information centers, and and we would would come across uh, sort of clunky communication systems, and we thought, gosh, could this be done better? Could it be done more efficiently? Should we be together? And that sort of thing. I don't uh, want anyone to come away from here uh, with the impression that either. Uh, we haven't had spectacular uh, communications and cooperation between the city and the county and the Office of Emergency Management. Nothing could be further from the truth. And, and certainly we have overcome uh, any of those sort of clunky obstacles as they have come up. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, briefly I want to go over the El Paso County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, compare and contrast, and there isn't much to contrast with the city of Colorado Springs, and then uh, kind of lay out uh, opportunities that might exist and open it up for, for all of you to uh, discuss these possibilities. Uh, from the El Paso County perspective, uh, there's, uh, we're, we're a little different from the uh, municipalities, and the munis municipalities are a municipal corporation. Uh, we, we use the term uh, home rule cities. Uh, and you're created by a charter established by the voters. Uh, county government is not established that way. Uh, county government is, is established by the state constitution and a whole lot of uh, laws passed by the state legislature. So uh, today we're talking about uh, the Colorado Dis Disaster Emergency Act of 2013. 
Uh, that mandates that each county shall maintain a disaster agency or participate in a local or interjurisdictional disaster agency. So that's our mandate as county government. It's required by state law, and it, uh, it sets out exactly where, where the county's background is. From a historical perspective, the Office of Emergency Management at the county was under the Board of County Commissioners. It was an administrative office until 1998 when the county commissioners delegated the statutory responsibilities for OEM and HAZMAT to the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. Uh, during the Waldo Canyon fire, uh, and Mr. Green certainly remembers this well, uh, state officials suggested that the county ought to make some changes in the way the El Paso County Office of Emergency Management operated. Uh, this was uh, in response to certain statutory requirements. Had nothing to do with fire response or fire management. Had to do with the administrative requirements associated with an Office of Emergency Management. In response to that, in 2014, the Board of County Commissioners uh, made the determined to transition, determination to manage the, uh, to move the transition, transition it back to county administration. 2012 to 2015, what a time we had. Four nationally declared disasters. Uh, lessons learned from that were many. One that we learned was that first responder agencies are not the best suited to meet all of the administrative requirements associated with long-term recovery and mitigation. Uh, I think a, a, a simple reality is, and, and the folks from the fire and police department, uh, you know, their, their job is to, is to rush up, put out that fire, make sure that safe things are safe and under control, and then, of course, the hard work of recovery and mitigation begins at that point. And that's why it makes abundantly good sense to support a robust Office of Emergency Management that is more perhaps closely tied to your finance operations and your administration than it is to your public safety. So that, that is the uh, determination that was made. I think there was a time that the city of Colorado Springs housed its OEM under the fire department and, and similar determinations were made there. Again, uh, you know, the fire, fire folks do a great job with response. The Office of Emergency Management, I like to think of as three R's, ready, respond, and recover. Okay, the Office of Emergency Management leads emergency planning and preparedness, supports emergency response, and coordinates short and long-term recovery. I put uh, our mission statement up there, but it talks about building a more resilient community through cooperation and competence in emergency management. City of Colorado Springs, uh, plans proactively and does a great job for hazards, works to reduce threats, and prepares Colorado Springs citizens to respond and to recover from a disaster. The Colorado Springs Office of Emergency Management is responsible for providing mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and coordination for large-scale emergencies and disasters. These are scalable. We all know about Waldo Canyon and Black Forest, but uh, you know every blizzard. Uh, is on some scale its own uh, emergency. Uh, OEM planning anticipates future disasters and develops a cooperative process to prevent and mitigate hazards. Uh, response, of course, manages the emergency operations center during uh, an event as well as a joint information center to provide necessary information to the citizens. The EOC serves as the central coordination point for emergency support functions, supplies, equipment, communication, and public information. Uh, those uh, firefighters on the line, the police officers on the line uh, are going to need fuel, they're going to need supplies, they're going to need water, uh, they're going to need logistical help. Many times they need road graders and bulldozers and all, all sorts of things, and that's where uh, the Office of Emergency Management comes in. Recovery includes restoration of public infrastructure, such as roads and bridges and drainages, as well as support and assistance to citizens who've been impacted by the disaster. Uh, mitigation is responsible for writing and update hazard mitigation plans for the city, uh, responsible for outlining the functions and responsibilities of all city departments and agencies. Uh, preparedness, I think that pretty well speaks for itself. Uh, great, great efforts being put forth by both the city and the county to get citizens engaged in their own uh, preparedness because after all they're, as Commissioner Littleton likes to say frequently, the first real responders on the scene. 
Recovery, boy, this has been a job. Uh, Gordon Brenner's here, uh, Brian Olson's here. Uh, these are the guys who've, who've been involved uh, on the front lines. It's, uh, it's a whole lot of moving dirt and building concrete, but even more than that, it's a lot of pushing papers and coming up with numbers and applying for grants and a lot of, a lot of really uh, uh, tough, heavy lifting. Long-term recovery involves restoring economic activity, rebuilding communities, and restoring the citizens' quality of life. Um, the El Paso County Office of Emergency Management and Wildland F Facility. Uh, some of you have not been there, many of you have. It's at 3755 Mark Dabbling Boulevard. It is right along Interstate 25 between Fillmore and Garden of God's Road. This uh, particular facility uh, has about 53,000 usable square feet. Uh, we have dedicated about uh, 8,000 to the operations of the Office of Emergency Management. We've got another 30,000 square feet that are uh, tied up with the uh, wildland fire operations, uh, primarily apparatus storage. It takes up a lot of space to uh, house some of those great big uh, fire trucks. And then uh, we have uh, about uh, 9,000 square feet of that facility dedicated to fleet operations. Uh, these are uh, primarily to support the vehicles affiliated with OEM and wildland fire. City of Colorado Springs Emergency Operations Center is located at 370 uh, Printers Parkway. It primarily occupies something that I think is commonly called FD West. FDC. FDC West. Um, it, uh, it includes the uh, city's emergency operations center. It's the second half of FDC West. And then they have some additional support uh, operations, some additional space that can be used across the street. So you kind of cross uh, Printers Parkway, uh, and uh, there's another 43, well, there's additional space over there that is dedicated for OEM, uh, the Joint Operations Center, some training facilities, and that sort of thing. So that gives you an idea of the two facilities that currently exist. Looking at the budget, the El Paso County Office of Emergency Management is about $800,000 a year, plus the operation of the uh, building itself uh, and, and all of the support that goes into that building, you know, your IT and all that stuff, another $165,000. Uh, so that's the way the, uh, the county's budget looks. Uh, the city's budget, not surprisingly, is pretty similar, $829,000 a year. Uh, for the operation of the Office of City Man of uh, Emergency Management. So, so again, you have two, in many ways, kind of similar sized uh, operations. Uh, currently, both the city and the county maintain offices of emergency management. Uh, it is uh, possible in terms of opportunities, and this is up to all of you folks, uh, that uh, an intergovernmental uh, intergovernment agreement could be used. A state statute certainly allows the county to enter into a multi-jurisdictional operation. Uh, and so you could establish a regional office of, em of emergency management. Uh, that would have to be uh, subject to approval by the City of Colorado Springs Council and the Board of El Paso County Commissioners. Uh, the IGA could include provisions, if you wanted it to, for adding additional jurisdictions. Uh, or you could determine that that's not necessary because the additional uh, jurisdictions would, would still fall under the county umbrella. So those are, are all things that, that could be discussed uh, if, if that's a direction uh, that, that we wanted to go in. It came up in, uh, in a meeting in uh, March or April of this year uh, when our uh, new commissioners were, were getting a tour and getting a briefing at OEM uh, and... Uh, and uh, uh, Commissioner President Glenn uh, turned to staff and said, well, you know, uh, this is maybe an opportunity. We need to look into this. And so that's why we're here today with this, with this on the agenda. Um, potential advantages, obviously you could eliminate some duplication. Uh, perhaps you could increase some service ca capacity. Uh, you would be enhancing regional cooperation and, and certainly it would facilitate smoother communications. I think those of us who have uh, worked in EOCs and JICs have, have uh, uh, one incident that uh, comes to mind in particular was a blizzard that uh, the, the weather kept changing. That never happens here. And, uh, and uh, we, we were working on Woodman Road and the county would get its section of Woodman Road open 
and, and the city would be struggling to open their section. Of, then they'd get theirs open and ours would blow back closed again. And the communications to the public and within the uh, two offices of emergency management was, was a real struggle simply because this was a moving target and the weather was not cooperating. And uh, that, that might be a case where, where being side by side and co-located would help at least a little, though it, it wouldn't do much to help the weather. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if desired by uh, county commissioners and city councilors, uh, we think that uh, a way you might want to, to go would be to establish a steering committee, uh, including the primary stakeholders, elected, uh, elected representatives. Uh, certainly we'd want to include our, our public safety folks from the uh, fire department, the sheriff's office, and the Colorado Springs Police Department, and then key administrative staff uh, looking at the actual uh, management uh, operations and how this would work in terms of budget and that sort of thing. Um, that, that group could fully explore these opportunities, make recommendations to their respective boards, and you could determine whether you wanted to move forward and, and how to do that. So anyway, that's kind of our, our presentation. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, as long as I've been at the county, uh, we have been uh, charged with, uh, with uh, trying to keep our eyes open uh, for ways to work together uh, with the city of Colorado Springs. If there's a way to improve efficiency or provide better service, uh, the Board of County Commissioners has always wanted us to step up and say, hey, we think this might be something worth talking about. And certainly, uh, this we think is something worth, worth talking about. Uh, Dave, thank you for that presentation. Um, I think everybody at this table owes it to their constituents uh, um, from a public safety perspective and as taxpayers uh, to look at areas for uh, cooperation where we can eliminate redundancy and be more efficient. Uh, there's a couple of relationships we have. As you know right now, the city contracts with the county for um, all our uh, janitorial services, things like that. Um, uh, I, uh, I believe there's some future opportunities uh, maybe in um, uh, fleet management of large vehicles and things like that. But when I look at all the possibilities, the one that strikes me as making the most sense is this one. Uh, this is an area where um, I think if you look around the country, this is an area where a lot of people have chosen to, to have consolidated uh, efforts because they're more efficient. And it seems to me that to the extent there's any concerns by the Manitou Springs or the Fountains or whatever about uh, county emergency services some, somehow being lessened, that that can be um, mitigated by the terms of the IGA. I mean, we can uh, start with an IGA that dictates uh, you know, certain levels of staffing and attention and things like that. But just it seems to me there's some economies of scale just by putting it under one roof. Uh, having one executive director, uh, common use of equipment, uh, and a few things like that. I mean, uh, just starting out before you even explore what other sorts of economies of scale there are, uh, it makes a lot of sense. So um, I would encourage uh, uh, council members and I would encourage uh, uh, commissioners to, uh, to move forward and, and let's see what, what we can work out in terms of um, possibilities and bring it back to the city and county. Well, and, and I certainly, uh, Daryl Glenn, Board of County Commissioners, I, and I can have my colleagues chime in. We haven't made any decisions, uh, but the one thing that we have learned after coming through fires and floods uh, is to take a hard look at your after action reports and not be afraid to ask questions. Even if you end up not doing anything or making any process improvements, we have a responsibility to our citizens to always look for ways to become uh, more efficient. And I think that we, we are still struggling a little bit uh, internally with you know, separating first response and recovery within the county. So we're still trying to work out some of those issues. Uh, but I think it's, it's very important for us to have the discussion. And I wanna make sure that we get some very frank feedback, pros and cons, on whether or not we should even explore setting up a stakeholder to then take it to that next level. But I just wanna reassure you, we haven't made any decisions, but I believe it is our responsibility to at least ask the question. 
Thank you, Peggy Littleton, El Paso County Commissioner. Um, this is exciting that we're having this discussion. This is something I've been wanting for the, my entire time uh, while I've been a county commissioner because uh, as the representative for CCI Colorado County Inc. on the Homeland Security Advisory Council, I think one of the things that we hear on a consistent basis is that when you can have regional fusion, when you can have people communicating together, sitting under the same roof, uh, talking and knowing what the right and left hand are doing together, you gain those efficiencies. You gain efficiencies in training, uh, planning for an event, um, responding to an event, uh, and certainly I uh, know the mayor and I have spoken about this many times, and I'm really glad that um, he's supportive of this as well, because I think it really is the best thing for our community. Many communities uh, across the nation have done uh, such things as this. I think uh, fiscally it's responsible for us to do. Um, I think it's going to provide a better service for our constituents as far as response uh, in, in the long run. Uh, certainly it's not one of the those where any one entity would own it, it would be its own its own entity that is uh, managed by a uh, executive director that is hired. Uh, so the city doesn't get to own it, the county doesn't get to own it. We all get to work together on this, and it's certainly something that we want Manitou and Fountain and Monument and our other municipalities to be a part of as well, because it's critical that we look at this as a regional uh, regional fusion for communication, planning, preparation, and response. Senator Murray. Uh, Councilman Murray, I've done emergency work for a number of years and 100% supportive of the consolidation as long as it includes uh, consolidated ambulance service as well. Because if you don't consolidate all the processes together, okay, under one roof, then you run into jurisdictional issues, locational issues, and payment issues. So I'm sure. Uh, that uh, you're including uh, consolidated ambulance services in with this. Is that a correct assumption? That would be a consideration. Well, uh, it on the table. that's a bit at the next level. I think right now we're still trying to figure out do we impanel a stakeholder group? And that could be an issue that comes up as we need to consider this. Yeah, if you include that issue in there, I think that the consolidation would be in the benefit of everyone in the community. That might. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stan Vandwerf, El Paso County Commissioner. Uh, I, I support creating some uh, form of board or committee, steering committee or whatever, because we, uh, we are obligated as elected officials to make sure we do everything we possibly can to get the most out of uh, the taxpayers' dollars, and so this is appropriate to do. I think uh, the design of what looks right uh, can be perhaps sometimes not that easy. And some of my experience in working in joint operations in the Department of Defense, uh, we know the value of being co-located because the communication is very, very efficient. But sometimes you get into budgets and jurisdictional boundaries that can be very, very complicated. And trying to make those work if you try to do a true integration process can be really, really difficult. Having said that, I'm not here to say what's a better design or what's a worse design. I think let's, I would recommend we go forward with uh, some type of a, you know, a multi-jurisdictional body that addresses these issues and works through a design process so that we can do the best for, for our citizens. To the extent of emergency services, that's the ambulance. I think that is a reasonable topic of discussion. Uh, maybe we start with OEM and, and can then continue through. Maybe ESA becomes a next excellent point. And I bet you there's a half dozen others that if we put our minds to it, we'll find that are worthwhile topics of discussion. And again, for the same purposes of making sure we remain effective, see if we can maybe be a little bit more effective, keep our jurisdictional boundaries and budgets um, sound because we owe that to our own constituents as well. Um, but then find every possible way to save that, save that taxpayer's dollars. So I support it. I think we should go forward. Thanks. Merv, uh, Merv Bennett, uh, City Council. Uh, being one of the folks that was evacuated for nine days during Waldo Canyon, I remember it very well still. And uh, one of the things that I remember during that process is that when the fire was in the county, uh, we were participating but it was clear that the county was, was, was in charge. But it, when it flipped over into the city, there was a lot of discussion. Who's responsible now? 
for providing leadership to this. That's wasted time. So uh, I, I can see this as being very beneficial so that we have a unified voice no matter where these things go, whether it's flood, whether it's fire, that we have a unified group uh, that we all support addressing this and we don't lose any time. One of the things that happened in Cedar Heights prior to the fire is that we practiced several times our evacuations. So when my, and I was in Indiana when it happened, but when, when my wife had to evacuate, within a half hour, she was able to capture everything that we could not replace and evacuate. And it's because we had prepared for it. And one of the learnings I had from the uh, Waldo Canyon fire is that we did a great job, we can do it even better. And this would help us to do it better. Yeah, Sandy, um, I, I think there's a lot of potential in this thing. Uh, I've done an awful lot of, what? For you. Oh, Andy Pico, Colorado <laughs> Springs City Council. Um, I've been involved in doing this in the DOD quite a lot. Uh, I operated in joint command centers that had multiple entities in it, and on one occasion I was involved in joining two disparate, geographically separated uh, commands into a single command center. Um, and yeah, you know, when you join military commands together, there's blood on the bayonets in the process. <laughs> but um, you know, learn a lot of lessons in that, and, and the jurisdictional boundaries and, and what you can and cannot do uh, becomes very important. But it's you improve your operational effectiveness, not just efficiency. You know, you don't just save dollars. The effectiveness is the key. Is you make it more effective in delivering the services or whatever it is that you need to do. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential opportunities. There's a number of pitfalls, uh, things to watch out for, and, and I think we should uh, press forward to take a look at it. We may or may not actually do this, but we certainly owe it to our constituents to take a hard look at it. Thank you very much. Tom Strand, Colorado Springs City Council. Uh, I had been talking to Brett Waters uh, for several months, and, and I know he and Dave, thanks so much for the presentation and all the hard work that's gone into the initial stages of this. Uh, as one member of city council, I'm supportive of, of, of following up on what you, you began here by establishing some kind of a steering committee with primary stakeholders to go forward. And it, it sounded almost to me like it was a no-brainer. But Stan, you brought up some issues, and, and last week, uh, council members Avila and uh, Murray and I were at the uh, uh, Colorado Municipal League uh, convention that, that was held last week. And uh, just instantly, I talked to the state uh, emergency management folks who had great praise for, for both the county and city of El Paso and Colorado Springs. But they brought to my attention then when Boulder and its county uh, started this, there were some serious issues that came up and some real problems. So I folded in and talked to the Boulder folks, and, and I think we, we need to learn from some of the lessons that they had as they combined this, that this is not as easy as it would have appeared to me uh, had I not had that conversation with them and, and maybe other county and, and cities uh, within the state or, or maybe either other states. Uh, but to, to, to further this with a committee that is going to really wrap themselves into this, I'm in favor of that. I think it makes great sense. The efficiencies uh, that Peggy talked about, uh, I, I just think we, we need to do this slowly and carefully and with great deliberation and all kind of hold hands uh, and share experiences that some of our sister counties and cities have experienced. Yes, ma'am. Nothing is ever as easy as we think it's going to be. Um, so I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, Chief Joe Rubiro also thinks it's a great move and um, has offered to be part of the process moving forward if you'd like his participation. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lojinos Gonzalez, County Commissioner, uh, District 4. Uh, I, I've been generally supportive of uh, regionalization. Uh, I think, as uh, Council Member uh, Pico mentioned, uh, operational effectiveness, uh, efficiencies have been brought up. Uh, are, these are very, very important. Uh, so I've been generally supportive of these ideas. Uh, my concern is occasionally when you start building something new, uh, you have a little bit of a spiral bureau uh, bureaucracy, you know, running amok. I don't want to see, a, you know, a $800,000 800, budget, $800,000 budget 
budget that ideally, and I'll make a number on say 10 personnel, 10 personnel come together and what should be $1.6 million or slightly less for efficiencies and 20 personnel or slightly less based on efficiencies turn into, well, we need 2 million a year and we need to hire five additional people. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's something I would watch for. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, uh, regionalization, uh, if it's done right, can bring those efficiencies and it's something I'm generally supportive of. But uh, uh, I do want to make sure that we do not let this then grow out of a, a new uh, bur bureaucracy that uh, runs amok. <laughs> Mr. Littleton. Thanks. I think one of the success stories we have that we know we can work together is I think every single one of the municipalities that is in here um, wrote a letter of support for uh, El Paso County applying for the Complex Coordinated Terrorist Attacks Grants. Um, and so one of these days we'll find out if you know the, the glacial pace at which the federal government goes, whether we are contender for that or not. But we already know we can work together. We already know that we can have the discussion and support one another. So I think that was the first step forward. Anybody else? Please. Uh, uh, Brett Waters, uh, City of Colorado Springs, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, I, I would echo all, all the statements here. I think there's, there's great opportunity uh, for a number of reasons, having been in the field for many years. Uh, I would echo Councilmember Strand's uh, comments as well, that it is a, should be a systematic approach in the sense of, of progressively going through a process and exploring opportunities. I have talked, uh, visited with Sheriff Elder in detail on this, and he's very supportive of, of the conversation as well, and is very willing to participate, so thank you. Anybody else? Well, what I want to do is, uh, I want to wrap this issue up and let's take a 10 minute break. And, but from what I'm hearing is there's at least support to uh, set up a stakeholder group. So ours, uh, we'll give direction to reach out to the various member organizations for members to participate in that. But uh, again, no decisions have been made, but I think it's a worthy discussion. But just to make sure, we're probably looking at like a couple of members of the council, maybe a couple of commissioners, and then primary emphasis on the people that do the, the organizations work. that actually do the work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and smaller municipalities. Uh, we can have, yeah, representation from smaller municipalities, but it's got to be uh, fire, uh, police, sheriff, all those folks that are uh, the, the two emergency Operation operations center. center directors, and let's get going. Okay. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll probably we'll stretch into 15. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, All right, now we are going to talk about item number four. If we could have everybody back at the table, please. And that is uh, marijuana. It's hard not to live in Colorado and at least not put this on your agenda, whether we do anything about it or not. But uh, we figure since we're having a regional type of meeting, we might as well at least put it on the agenda. Um, from the county's perspective, we don't really have an action. I don't, I don't know if the city wants to provide us with an update of what's going on, but I will turn it over to, to you, please. Sure. Uh, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, Brett Waters uh, with the City of Colorado Springs. Uh, I currently chair uh, the Marijuana Work Group. We've had that in place for nearly two years. Uh, and just a few updates uh, from that group. One, um, we've had a moratorium for some time, uh, and it's just ending in the city of Culver Springs. In that time, we've put together uh, improved zoning and restrictive zoning for marijuana grows and uh, medically infused products. Uh, we've instituted a 12 plant count in residential homes. Uh, we've uh, limited uh, dispensaries, and so essentially we're not issuing any more licenses for marijuana dispensaries at this time. Um, on the task, on this task force, I chair it, but we also we have council member Scorman, President Scorman, who's uh, our council liaison with uh, council member Geislinger. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez has joined us. Thank you, Commissioner, in that work group. So <clears throat> truly a regional work group. Uh, we also have uh, caregivers. We have uh, individuals who essentially uh, specialize in research, uh, Colorado College professor. Uh, we have uh, attorneys, uh, maybe several, I believe, um, neighbors, and of course staff and law enforcement staff. So we tackle a number of issues on that work group. We've made uh, a lot of headway, we feel in looking at the industry. I think one of the areas, and uh, the mayor is very familiar with this, is um, and I'm not sure if Chief Kerry's made it yet, but gray market activities certainly have uh, consumed a lot of resources, both from CSPD and from our V&I 
group that is a regional law enforcement group. And so uh, I'm not sure that's going away anytime soon, uh, but it's something we, we on a regular basis deal with uh, anywhere from large grows and, and other activities that uh, occur. Uh, one of the quotes from our VNI commander was uh, years ago we used to be an importer of, of marijuana. Now uh, Colorado is an exporter uh, without question. And so I think that's a, an issue that we continue to deal with. We think the regulated industry, however, we've made great strides on in the last couple of years and continue to work with them. The industry is on our work group. Uh, we, I think we have a very good relationship with them and uh, we continue to, to address a, a number of issues and just uh, worked on uh, some fees uh, just in the last few months. So. I think that's their update. Brett, would you, uh, I just want to clarify, while we have a current moratorium in place for no uh, future medical marijuana uh, licenses, how many current mar medical Sh marijuana licenses? Sure, uh, we have uh, 100, over 130, 132, 132 uh, dispensaries. Um, in, in Colorado Springs. That's just dispensaries. There's usually an associated grow that is another license and maybe a medical infused product MIPS that's another license, but dispensaries is 132. Essentially, our approach is we're just simply not issuing any more licenses. So if someone forfeits a license, the number goes down to 131 or 130 and it continues to go down. Uh, we feel, and in, in, in industry agrees, that there's just simply a lot of dispensers out there and uh, there's really no reason to come up with a number. It's just gonna systematically go down until we uh, need to address it again, so. Um, Tom Strand, City Council. Brett, at, at the uh, Colorado Municipal League, this was a big subject. Could you explain to everyone the difference between gray market and black market? Yeah, and I think, Chief Kerry, I think Chief Kerry's made it. Um, I'll do my best. I think a, um, and it's hard to distinguish that, but I think, and maybe Sarah Johnson can join me if she might have some input as well. She's going like this. Yeah. I think a, a, a common, maybe gray market activity, maybe a higher, they have uh, more plants in their homes. Uh, one another activity is they, they essentially gift. Uh, Chief Kerry, come on, join me. <laughs> Uh, marijuana, go. <laughs> um, one of the things that Chief Carey and his group deals with a lot is essentially those who are great market activities where they will gift things. So you'll come into a head shop, they'll gift uh, a lighter for 50 bucks and, and gift you uh, some marijuana. And so there, there's a lot of loopholes that have presented themselves that legally we we're trying to address, but frankly, they, they spawn faster oftentimes than we can address them. So maybe not purely black market, uh, they, they set up these shops, they don't have a business license, they seek to gift or, or overprice an, a product <laughs> and then gift uh, marijuana. And that's many so, of the things so that we're So traditional with. black market of marijuana or anything would be behind, the, you know, the, in the alley where a dealer is selling uh, marijuana uh, to a customer. Or exporting it. Uh, yeah. or, or exporting it. We're just talking about the difference between gray and black. Good afternoon, Police Chief Pete Carey. Thank you for uh, uh, showing patience. I was uh, finishing up a three-day conference, so um, I appreciate it very much. Um, and I think what... Um, uh, Brett was talking about is uh, anything dealing with the transfer of marijuana is really, really difficult to uh, get to the bottom of because uh, my, I think my personal favorite, for example, is uh, Craigslist. You can buy a Jimi Hendrix poster for $300 um, and then you get an ounce of uh, marijuana for free. Uh, that that's a good one. Um, so is it is it uh, is it a transfer? Well, no, we're giving uh, we're giving that we're gifting that, which is okay. I guess, uh, uh, but uh, we're selling the poster. So we're spending a lot of time in, um, um, in black market investigations as well as, you, as these gray market ones. Uh, they're very, very time consuming and what we're finding through Metro v &I is that uh, some of the black market um, is kind of mixing in as far as uh, the transfer and the transporting of the drugs out of, out of town and out of state. Thank you. As a, a matter of clarification, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but our council has clearly, as a matter of city ordinance, outlawed the kind of gifting that you're talking about. That's correct. Okay. Well, I know one question that always comes up is uh, recreational. 
uh, and whether or not there is a going to be a push to allow people to vote on that or what. Uh, we certainly, uh, from a county standpoint, aren't even talking about that, but everybody that I come in contact with, and I know it has <laughs> been uh, subjects of different campaigns, that issue is brought up, and I don't know whether or not any of the municipalities have even formulated an opinion about that yet. Well, we know Matthew uh, has. <laughs> well, this is easy. <laughs> that was easy. Well, that went over like crickets. <laughs> Just nothing. It's like, yes. Okay. Please. Please. Uh, Bill Murray's uh, Colorado Springs City Council. Uh, could we possibly all get together and just put it on the ballot and let the people decide once and for all, uh, instead of the individual jurisdictions taking advantage? I was over in Manitou not that long ago, uh, talking to the folks over there, and there was a long line, and I asked everybody in the line where they came from, and they all came from Colorado Springs. And, uh, okay, so, uh, how, do, how do you guys really want to play this thing out? I'd like to have a uh, countywide vote for recreational marijuana and let's get over this whole thing over with and see what happens. Sharon Thompson, Fountain City Council. There's this little thing called home rule law and uh, I don't think any of us are going to give it up for a countywide position on this. <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner Wall. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I can tell you as um, somebody who represents a significant portion of northeastern El Paso County, uh, a place where you know we have projections of over 400 illegal grow operations going on uh, out in the county right now. I, I can tell you, my constituents, I, I just don't see have any appetite for. Um, you know, engaging in this discussion in terms of a ballot issue right now. Oh. It grows a lot. Yeah. Anybody else? There. Yo, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, Lojinos Gonzalez, County Commissioner. Uh, same thing in my district, which is, includes the south part and the eastern uh, plains of uh, uh, El Paso County. Uh, I get the most calls on two issues, roads and marijuana illegal uh, grows in issues accompanied with that. Uh, the northwest part of my area is the southern part of uh, uh, Colorado Springs that transitions to El Paso County and the homelessness numbers have been going up. Uh, other issues, a lot of these things were waiting on data and when I had the national conference uh, on homelessness, I asked the question and uh, the nation is still wor uh, waiting on results. Uh, but uh, at a Board of Health meeting, they did mention that the numbers are up and uh, the numbers of homelessness in our area are from out of the area. Uh, they were not sure yet of whether they were Colorado or from out of state, uh, but uh, the numbers are higher uh, coming to Colorado Springs. So if, if those are from out of state, well, that's a concern. And uh, I did specifically ask the, the question, how is this, uh, what are the numbers looking like for the states that passed marijuana laws? And uh, nationwide, they are still waiting on the results. So I would be very against seeing anything uh, approved uh, because uh, I, I think the negative results are still coming in. We just saw the log largest raid happen uh, the other day up in the Den Denver metro area uh, because of this illegal black market, out of state uh, uh, drug market. And I, I think it's being uh, uh, aided with the recreational market, so. Commissioner Wallace. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Glenn. And I don't mean to put the uh, DA on the spot here, but I was wondering if he could talk to some of the crime issues related to marijuana in El Paso and Teller counties. Sure, the, uh, if you want to talk about crime issues. Uh, we have, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we have seen the opposite of prohibition. Uh, when we had prohibition and it was alcohol, obviously it grew gangsters, it grew crime uh, across the country. When we legalized uh, liquor, it, it got rid of some of the, a lot of that and you just don't really see it in the alcohol industry anymore. For whatever reason, we've gotten the opposite effect. Police resources across the state, much less in either county, uh, on uh, the black market, uh, 
in marijuana is greater than it's ever been in the history of Colorado. Uh, you, your Colorado Springs Police Department last year put out that we had 22 homicides. Eight of those are directly related to marijuana. Down in my office, we're now referring to marijuana as the gateway drug to murder. The, um, uh, and when I say directly, one example that isn't in our courts right now uh, was one where uh, some people uh, went to raid a house to steal the marijuana and uh, someone was shot and killed and, uh, in the backyard and they still haven't, I think, exactly figured out who did that murder, but it's not pending in my court, so it's one I can give as an example uh, when I say directly related. It's not just that somebody used some marijuana and something happened. These are directly over marijuana. The, um, um, uh, so your tax uh, expenditures on uh, uh, us prosecuting and the police uh, handling the black market is greater than it's ever been in the history of uh, certainly uh, El Paso County and I think the state of Colorado. Um, the, um, uh, it's a huge expenditure and we haven't solved it. You can get into a lot of the reasons why that's that way. Um, I think we made a lot of mistakes in Colorado when we put this forth. Um, we have these overlapping constitutional amendments that make it extremely impossible to uh, regulate some of this and that's where your gray market is. Quite frankly, marijuana, one of the simple things, and I think we'll see some legislation on it next year, uh, we were one of the few countries, if you will, if you look at our state, that didn't uh, put a cap on how much THC you can have in it. So quite frankly, Colorado's product is the best in the world. And the value of it out of this state is much greater than the value of it in this state. And so we have a huge black market and a selling point, and I think they're going to uh, look at that next year. Quite frankly, some of it is who we put in business. Um, I actually testified the legislature we could have had a good model that you saw for gaming. Gaming has uh, issues with it too, but if you look at what's happened in Blackhawk, Central City, Cripple Creek, they really scrutinize who's allowed in gaming. If you can get businessmen in gaming, you're more likely to get a business model up there. Uh, we have all sorts of exceptions in ours of, well, this felon shouldn't be in, it, be in uh, marijuana, but this felon's okay. So we don't scrutinize the background checks. We don't check who's getting into the industry. And in fact, we allow felons into the industry. Uh, our medical marijuana market was set up because of the way we set up how doctors regulated. If you know, in the first few years that it came up, it just said a doctor can uh, recommend the marijuana card. Uh, most of the, almost, well, a huge, huge percentage of those who got medical cards were from doctors who were no longer in good standing and could not even prescribe you a prescription strength of ibuprofen but they could sign off on your medical marijuana cards and that's what we got um, at the same time the um, Quite frankly, uh, what's happening now is our government is becoming addicted to marijuana. Um, and uh, that's at the state level, the local level, uh, and on down. And that's going to be a problem for us going forward and how you want to regulate it, that it is going to come down to money uh, and not looking at the other issues. On the Eastern Plains, I can tell you there's a water war going on. And if uh, other communities don't think that's not happening, marijuana uses a tremendous amount of water. Now, hemp is just the opposite. Hemp doesn't, it's, uh, doesn't use that much water. And I can tell you the people out east are wondering, one of the reasons they're out there, nobody can regulate how much is being taken out of those water tables out there. So that's a huge issue. Energy. Uh, 2015, the Colorado government put out that 1% um, of all the electricity in the entire United States was being used by our legal grow operations in the state of Colorado. It has a huge impact on our uh, um, our, our uh, carbon out output in the state of Colorado. So if you don't think there isn't an energy war going on uh, with marijuana, you're wrong. Uh, that's another area we're seeing. Certainly our kids. Um, last summer, uh, 2016, they did a snapshot of the hospitals. Every single hospital showed an increase in the number of babies born with THC in their system. Pueblo, 50% of the kids last June that they looked at, 50% of the kids were born with THC in their system at birth. Uh, so this is affecting us. Actually, as we get to open discussion, I would like to know what we're doing with the homeless. Actually, the Denver Post and the Chieftain did do surveys of the people that came into their area uh, right after we passed marijuana. It was a 50% increase up and down the front range of our uh, homeless in the first year. The next year, another 50% increase. Last year, you had records amounts. Uh, on the, we just started a new board 
board on criminal justice issues in the region, it sounds like one that they want to discuss is a homeless. It does seem to me that each jurisdiction, whether it's the county, whether it's cities, is coming up with their own solutions and quite frankly, sort of pushing the homeless problem around the community without having an overall homeless solution to it. But if you don't think it's not tied to marijuana, you're absolutely wrong. That's what the, uh, uh, what, that's what uh, certainly Pueblo uh, and the Denver Post in their uh, report showed. I don't know that Colorado Springs has done the same survey, uh, but you've seen the huge increase. You actually have been very, uh, I know the city has been very proactive in helping out veterans and uh, uh, what they're doing right now with the, the new homeless shelters, but it's already being overwhelmed every year. You come up with a new number and it increases. Manitou, I know that uh, actually I thought yours was very well designed. If you saw your uh, two marijuana retail, you'd think they're in the city of Colorado Springs. And you've actually put a uh, Highway 24 as a buffer between them and your kids uh, over in the school. So it was very well placed for your community. Uh, but at the same time, you're overwhelmed with the homeless. Uh, and I got to tell you, the Forest Service is the same thing. Last year, they wouldn't open the forest for several weeks because they had to do a cleanup of all the homeless uh, that would be pushed out of one municipality and then over into the forest. And they had to have the huge cleanups. And I think every, every agency, I, I would imagine every municipality and organization here has had to deal with homeless cleanup issues uh, on the camp. So I think there does need to be a coming together of how do we deal with this as a community. And, and I don't know necessarily what the solution is. Quite frankly, I, I think California made a mistake, but I know there's a lot of law enforcement agencies that are crossing their fingers uh, that the issues that we're seeing will move out of Colorado and uh, into California as others uh, pick up uh, what's going on. So other than that, so you don't have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he did that off the top of his head. <laughs> no notes. I was really I was impressed. I was, I was, I was, I was invited to this, but uh, I had not seen an agenda item at all, so I did not come prepared on that. Okay. <laughs> I was taking notes. <laughs> Please. Well, I, I just a real short comment. I, I mean, that was that pretty well covered the uh, the range of things, but four years ago when we were having this argument on council, I made the statement that we we're going to become the uh, Columbia of the Rockies, and we really have, it has, has come to pass. And you know, I, I know half the dis districts in Colorado Springs voted against and half voted for. Uh, so I would say that the, um, you know, I will continue to oppose it as much as I can. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just one final uh, comment, Commissioner. It's our schools, our streets, our kids, and um, uh, there are some numbers coming in. I think uh, a couple minutes ago, Commissioner Gonzalez said that those numbers, um, it's been a while, uh, but we're still waiting for those numbers. They're coming in now. Last week, uh, my great report from the insurance industry, our, our traffic crashes in Colorado and Washington State uh, pushing 15% increases. So those numbers are coming in. And uh, relating to the homeless people, our homeless outreach team, which is internationally acclaimed, does a lot of interviewing of homeless people of why they're here in this area, in this region. And marijuana, uh, is becoming the top of the list. It's a younger, more aggressive, mostly male crowd. They're in town and they're saying they're here for the weed. Thank you. Okay. Any last minute comments on this particular item before we move to open discussion? Go ahead. You know, it, it seems strange, Bill Murray, Colorado Springs, because I, I sat with a council listening to a homeless advocacy group that told us very precisely that the, the preponderance of the entire homeless population were local and that marijuana was not bringing people in. I'm hearing the exact opposite. Now, uh, one question that came up, how many convi marijuana convictions have we had in the last year? Again, I, I can uh, get that for you and get it over to you. I apologize, I did not know, I, as I say, I did not see the agenda, so I did not know mm -hmm. what any of the items would be today. I will say that, uh, um, if you want to look at your misdemeanor petty offense possession level, that actually is the city of Colorado Springs who prosecutes by far the majority of those. I know we looked at that a couple of years ago and we had almost none came through the sheriff's office. Colorado Springs Police Department had well over 200 marijuana cases in the city of Colorado Springs a couple of years ago, but I don't necessarily keep up. So part of the numbers you're going to want to get from uh, Winnetta in terms of uh, what you're prosecuting. Uh, what I'm trying, what I'm reaching for is uh, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between what I'm hearing to be the problem and enforcement and, and uh, conviction. And I've heard this consistently from numbers of folks, okay, that the numbers don't actually add up to A, B, and C. 
uh, that uh, I'd be reluctant to, to suggest to you from my level that homelessness has increased at the dramatic levels that you just suggested because of marijuana. We know marijuana is a cash crop and part of the problem is our own is because we, we don't let them put it in a bank. So everybody knows anybody who has any marijuana in the house has cash. So we've made them all banks and made them all targets. So we've created our own problems and we're not resolving our own problems. We're just saying the problem exists and hopefully it'll get worse so we can argue and win our case. And, and I keep on wondering where you guys are coming from and, and saying, and then we look across to Manitou and, and either you tell Manitou to stop it, okay, or else we resolve the issue amongst ourselves. And the only way to resolve this particular issue is just let the folks vote on it and, and let them have the opportunity. There is no difference today between a medical marijuana facility and a retail facility. I can call right on my phone right now, get a doctor, as you mentioned, to give me a red card. Matter of fact, I don't need a red card. I can go down Colorado Avenue and see a truck that's parked there and says, you don't need a red card, come on in. I saw a guy the other day with a bag of marijuana and it appeared he was going car to car selling what he had. And, and, but he wasn't selling the marijuana, he was selling something else and giving the marijuana as a gift. I mean, this, this thing is so full of holes and here we are discussing a problem. So either we resolve the problem one way or the other, but, but we can't, can't keep on going these two different directions without uh, the, the consequences, if, if you're, you're correct, increasing. And I think once the population gets used to the recreational marijuana, they'll do the same thing they did with the medical marijuana. I mean, it'll, you'll see this, it'll start to drop off. But if we don't let the people decide, and we decide for them, and without the legislative uh, activities, then and we'll be discussing this one two or three years from now. Thank you. Councilmember Avila. Councilmember Avila. Um, I'm just curious to see, marijuana use has gone up. I, that's what I'm getting, right, from the kids and everywhere. Has opiate use gone up, methamphetamines, mm -hmm. and all the type of illegal drug activity, have those gone up as well? And, and, and what are they to proportion to each other? Councilor Avia, Police Chief Pete Carey, I can tell you uh, that we are almost at epidemic proportions across the country and in Colorado with opiate or heroin use. Um, it is prevalent in many of our schools, in our high schools here in Colorado Springs and El Paso County. I will tell you that methamphetamine for the last few years, if I'm not mistaken, has been pretty much steady. Um, and there has been an um, increase in the last few years with cocaine use, even crack cocaine. And marijuana has been a dull roar for decades. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, oh, just to, I'm sorry. Oh, just go ahead. Oh, go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, 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 just to answer a question, it was either the Denver Post or the Gazette had an article about six months ago, I'll say, where they compared the use levels of cocaine, methamphetamine, opioids or heroin, uh, alcohol, and marijuana, and Colorado was the only state in the union that was top five in every category. Um, so that was one that they noted that's changed uh, over time. I did want to also respond, you, um, uh, Councilman Murray, you looked at me when you said, why not shut down Manitou? Uh, I don't have the capabilities of shutting down Manitou. That's not in the law, and I respect that each municipality and county government does have uh, powers through their either their council or their people to decide on uh, what they want in their particular community at different levels. I at times have stepped out to talk to city attorneys about uh, there are certain enforcement areas that I do, which is really the black market, but when you're talking about whether you want to have uh, the bars where people can use it, whether you want to have warehouses where people can combine their marijuana, whether you want to have an open container law, because the state one, quite frankly, is not uh, sufficient. I've advised city attorneys that that's up to your municipality, and I respect the municipalities that, to be able to set the tone in their community and what they want. President Scorm. Well, uh, my uh, my name is Score Man, so uh, it's a it's a good good name for this discussion. No, just kidding. Uh, just it was a corny joke. I had to, I had to lighten all this up. But the, you know you know the the issue is really about the illegal market and the black market. 
and you think about it, it it's legal here. It is. We can possess it, and we can smoke it, and as long as you're doing it in the privacy of your home, and you're not doing it in public, and you're not driving, it's legal. And as you say, uh, uh, Dan, that this is, this is going to be hard to change. It's in the Constitution now, and we just made the Constitution harder to change this last election. So what do we do? And by the way, it's the dispensary owners who are pushing for recreational marijuana to shut down the black market and the gray market. If you talk to them, they say that that's the, they don't like it, they, uh, they, it's not regulated, and we, we, we have a good system in place for alcohol. You can't buy a beer and, and drink it in the car. And you can't go around and, and uh, drink uh, you know, liquor without following the rules. You can't be 20, you have to be 21. So, so if you go to the stores in Manitou, they, you, know, you, you, you show your ID, they make sure that you haven't gone to other stores, you know, they, they make sure that you, you've bought a certain amount in a certain period of time. But we cannot have it, uh, uh, we can wish it to go away, and it won't. And, and it's been a bad experiment in Colorado. I, I absolutely agree, but I think it's also something that uh, other states now are learning from, and many other states are now uh, uh, get, getting into the uh, the business because people want it. The, the majority of Americans want it. The, the latest polls I looked were 60, 67 percent. It's because it's a, it's a drug that a lot of people use like they use alcohol. They, uh, and, and by the way, if you want to go into all those same statistics about alcoholism and alcohol problems and alcohol-related crime, we allow it because it's, it's a personal choice. We could throw people in jail for it, which is what we did for years. And by the way, Colorado always had the highest per capita use of marijuana. I know it's, you know, it's probably gotten even more because it's more available. Every, every city in the country has a homeless problem. And, and many of them have worse homeless problems than us, and they don't have legal marijuana. It, it's, you, you can't keep associating everything with marijuana. I'm not saying there aren't huge problems with it. My, my, my point is, if the voters want it, then we would have the money, the revenue, to deal with it. We're right now, Chief Kerry, you're strained, you know, and, and Sheriff Elder is too, and, and everybody, you guys are as well, because you don't have the money to do it. But what we're doing is we're letting all this money bleed to other communities. Essentially, it's like opening, a, you know, we used to fight to not have a Walmart open in Woodland Park because we wanted the revenue to go to Walmart and on A Street in Colorado Springs. But we don't have any money to deal with it, and we have this huge black and gray market that we have to figure out how to stop. To, to me, that's the big issue. Uh, if the voters don't want it, and if, you're, you, if you guys are right, uh, Mark and, and Lajinos, that they don't want it, and, and, and we all say no, then it's an argument over with. If we make it legal and we highly regulate it, and we have the ability to get that revenue, and by the way, they, they talk about as much as a couple million dollars a month in revenue. And, and so you think about what that could mean for law enforcement, for drug education, for substance abuse issues. You know, you, you, we are dealing with an opioid epidemic. Maybe it's a way to help fund it. I'm not saying it, it's what I like, but I know that uh, you know, a lot of communities take alcohol money, for example, and use it for substance abuse. And, and uh, I just want to, I think the conversation is, a wrong, is the wrong one. We all hate the black market. We all hate the illegal grows. The grow houses, we don't want kids to use it. Nobody should drive. There's not a question. Can we make it legal here? Let's see if the voters want it. If they don't, we have our answer. But the majority of them did vote for it originally. And we'll see how that experiment goes. Commissioner Glenn? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I'll just add uh, one point of data as, as was brought up because uh, compared about using the revenues to offset the issues of social costs or uh, criminal costs, uh, you referenced alcohol. Alcohol uh, statistics, statistics show the social costs and the money that needs to go out to offset the profits made uh, by governments is 15 to 1. So for every dollar you're bringing in to fix issues, 
$15 are the issues. So even if marijuana is one-to-one, -one, maybe it's not as bad as alcohol, even if it's one-to-one, -one, then you are already spending too much money. And it likely is more than one-to-one -one if alcohol is 15-to-1. And so bringing in revenue to fix issues isn't going to help if you're just creating more issues. Thank you. Let me respond. It's already here. The, the issue is here. Whether we sell it recreationally or not, people are going to get it at the dispensaries. They're going to go to Pueblo. They're going to go to Manitou. So we have it. It's not. It's not going to go away unless we can change the constitution. You know, it, it, maybe we can do that, and maybe the state would want would want to. And by the way, I might support that. I'm just saying we have it. So what do we do? And and that, and that's the question here: is how how we deal with it. Uh, President Scorman, all, all great points. Um, my worry as a law enforcement officer is um, as we sort through this and deal with it, we're still dealing with the alcohol issues. We haven't even talked this afternoon about uh, the monumental problems we have with pres prescription drug abuse, methamphetamine, um, opioids, and all that. So we're still dealing with that. I strongly believe that if we uh, make marijuana recreational in Colorado Springs, it, there's going to be a lot more um, accessibility. We're going to have more of it. So we're going to deal with all those other issues plus more marijuana. I would respectfully um, uh, ask you to go do a ride along right now before we bring that into town, um, either with the deputy sheriff for our county officials or in the city of Colorado Springs and see what's going on right now. I did that a couple of months ago and I was amazed at the prevalence of it already without making it recreational um, uh, with our stores in town and, and what we're dealing with already. Uh, as it relates to domestic violence, um, uh, multifamily uh, housing complexes, and all those issues uh, with grows. Um, it, it amazed me. The other thing I'd recommend is uh, visiting a school and talking to the kids, talking to the teachers who aren't worried about the next bond election like the administrators are, and see what the impact is in the school and how pervasive uh, marijuana in the school. Our adolescent youth rate for 12 to 17 year olds is 74 percent above the national average. It's far and away the, the tops in the country. Um, and what, what, what the, the reality is the way we are handling marijuana has so dramatically reduced young people's perception of risk uh, that they use it at, at much higher rates. Uh, it's, there's a direct correlation between their perception of risk and their level of use. And the problem is um, I see um, recreational just continuing to lower their, their perception of risk. Hey, this is legal. Uh, there's no problems with it. And then the other thing that we haven't talked about here is um, our identity as a community. Um, and what or legalizing recreational marijuana does to our identity as a military-friendly community uh, who uh, probably in 2018 we're going to be fighting BRAC battles. Do we want to be the community, you know, and, and when the Army's doing environmental surveys and they're looking at uh, um, things like uh, uh, payday lending laws, uh, uh, drug laws, and things like that, do we want to be the community that Texas can point at and say, hey, move the this interim feeder division here because you don't have to deal with that. Um, and then, uh, gosh darn it, it's hard to be the Olympic City USA when you're telling your public that uh, uh, encouraging them to get high for fun. Um, and I just, uh, I just want, uh, we, that's uh, another discussion whether it's uh, something image wise as a community we want to get into. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Peggy Littleton. And I think going along uh, what Mayor Southers was talking about, we hear from numerous different employers within the city and the Regional Business Alliance also from um, people that are looking at moving possibly their businesses to um, El Paso County and the city of Colorado Springs. And workforce is a huge issue. Uh, having people, so many of these companies that are high-tech companies, we are the cyber capital of the world, you know. We are, uh, we're doing things that require people to be uh, free of drugs to be able to be employable in those in those arenas. And I think that uh, people have found it very difficult to find people to hire who have a clean uh, and a clear uh, background in that. And so we just have to look at that, you know, for our economic stability as well. Uh, does it put us at risk? Um, on the, I, that was another point, employers. Uh, we worked very hard, just to give an example, uh, Atmel 
was purchased uh, by a microchip, a big national company, uh, ba uh, headquartered in Arizona. We worked very hard to convince them to stay here. Um, worked hard on some utilities uh, issues that I think uh, members of the council are aware of. A microchip uh, has come in to just share with me uh, their drug testing numbers. They have some federal con contracts that require uh, drug testing. And they, the drug test is the last thing, and they say this is pretty important to them. So they've already screened out a lot of people by the time they get to the, so they've done a criminal background check, screened out people. They've done an interview to, you know, see if there's, you know, screen out the visually wackos, if you will. Uh, they've done a little, uh, a little math and communication analysis. They think this guy's a good employee, and then they do the drug test, and 25% of their applicants are, are uh, failing for THC. If I can, if I can respond to that, uh, they're testing for everything, including hemp oil. If people eat too much uh, of a hemp product, it will show up in, in their tests. I, I talked to Dan about that. It's not a test that distinguishes it, but no, no it, it's an issue all over the state. Uh, Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, Loveland, all these places have booming economies. Uh, Tacoma, Washington uh, has Fort Lewis, Washington. I, I, I know what you're saying, and uh, you don't want that to be a factor or a negative image, but what is it, 24 states now have it legal one way or another? Uh, yeah, we, we may find that we will lose people to Texas, but California has how many bases? Washington has how many bases? I, I just think that you, you don't want to get too broad about it. Uh, if, uh, if it's here, it's legal. I don't think it's going to go away. I, I know what you're saying, uh, Chief Kerry, that uh, if, it's if it's available recreationally, it might expose more people to it, it might be easier to get. But boy, it sure seems easy to get now. Uh, and and, and I, I, I hope we can at least uh, figure out how to deal with the black and gray markets, whether it's legal recreationally or not. And it, people who, uh, you know, we, we've had all these people come to city council recently who got off opioids through medical marijuana. And, and that's what they say was, was the key to them. They, they were, had back injuries, and they were addicted, and they went to medical marijuana, and they were able to get off the opioids. It's, I'm just saying that, you know, that's another example out there. It, um, if we go with recreational marijuana in this, in this city, in this uh, county, it's going to get a lot easier. Uh, an interesting point to back up what Commissioner Littleton said a minute ago is just last year in our testing process for police officer, uh, we DQ'd um, a number that's about five times higher than it was a few years ago. These are police officer candidates. They go to school for four years um, for criminal justice backgrounds, and, uh, and they're coming in and uh, admitting um, active, regular use of marijuana because uh, they came to Colorado to be police officers and smoke marijuana. Uh, I send them to the sheriff's office, by the way. <laughs> Any... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're really. Any, that wasn't necessary. <laughs> Chief Collis, I thought he was going to say he sent him to the fire department. <laughs> it's yeah. a big circle. Okay. Well, mar marijuana, I certainly wasn't expecting that when I saw that on the agenda, but it's a, it's a great discussion and one that I think that we still need to continue. We'll have one more comment, then we're going to open it up for some last-minute open discussion, and then... All right, two more. Two Go more ahead. To just follow up, Bill Murray again. Uh, the follow up with the President Scorman has said uh, we have a terrible problem of cherry picking information uh, and being contradictory and, and how we focus in on, on, on the actual problems. If the problems, if the largest problem is opioids, then we should be addressing that. We've got a chief that's critically short of police personnel. Anything and everything that affects him, okay, is, is exacerbated because he doesn't have enough people on the street. I rode with those folks. Two o'clock in the morning, the biggest problem was, as uh, uh, the county commissioner said, 15 to 1, because that was the fight of the drunks coming out of the bars in, in Taon. His dad stood there and watched them. Okay, so we're going to have to stop this this. Uh, appearance of contradiction, all right, and that's what I, I don't quite understand. We cherry pick individual pieces and then 
patch them up against marijuana and say marijuana is the cause of all these issues instead of focusing on the bigger particular problems we have. The bigger problems, opioids, heroin, it's obviously uh, uh, alcohol, and yet you, you pick on, on uh, marijuana. Uh, guys, it's coming across the border from Pueblo and from Manitou Springs. Again, it's, it's, it's right here. And whether the people are stupid enough to test for marijuana and be police officers, that's, buddy, you don't want them anyway. But I've been in the military for so many years and been through so many countries where all drugs are legal and had fewer problems than what you are suggesting are happening now. You know, what, what should be the, the, the people's prerogative is the people's choice and what they want. And the only way to understand that is not for us to talk amongst ourselves or make up numbers or associate them with something else, is to give the people the choice of whether or not that's what they want. So let's put it on the ballot and, and go forth. Thank you. Commissioner Vanderwerk, last comment. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a really interesting and enlightening discussion here. Uh, I think we have a real workforce issue. I mean, a very serious workforce issue here. We've got a, there are a lot of jobs in our community because of the Department of Defense and other uh, activities that are, are having trouble finding employees and a lot of them are because uh, those industries don't accept THC in the bloodstream uh, as um, um, uh, an employee for that industry. And in fact, I had lunch with my uh, dentist just yesterday, and uh, he has uh, four, uh, had four dental assistants and had to let two of them go on Monday because they did their drug test and found THC. So um, they're, I don't know if that's a, a policy with uh, the dental industry or his own personal policy, but uh, you know, this is a real issue with regard to workforce. And there's another way to look at this, and this is you know, working on making sure we provide opportunities for citizens for jobs. Uh, and when they engage in this activity, whether they have the right because we voted it in or not, they're actually closing down their own opportunities when they involve themselves, with job opportunities when they involve themselves with this uh, activity. So, I don't know, I think uh, not knowing what the answers are for this, there's certainly an education component that uh, needs to be done. Uh, I just think it's the best thing to stay away from it altogether. Uh, it does hurt your set. It does hurt you uh, when you use it, and uh, it closes down opportunities for citizens. Uh, not to mention the social costs and everything else that we have to deal with. So I just wanted to make that point about my dentist that just told me yesterday at lunch he had to let 50% of his dental assistants go because of this. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to transition to our last item, an open discussion. I'm actually going to kick it off and um, see if there's uh, a desire to participate in a kind of a stakeholder group that, that I'm really trying to push. What you're seeing, uh, we've created a criminal justice coordinating council. We're also starting to talk about social detox issues. And I think uh, a lot of our bodies have had people come forward with a concern with regard to homelessness and how all these things are, are linked together. And, and I really think it's important for one to pull the stakeholders together and really try to think outside the box and try to come up with some solutions, but also to make sure that government is in its proper role. I mean, government cannot be the driver, but government can be at the table because we're going to be a part of the equation one way or the other. We're going to either be uh, having to incarcerate these people and pay the costs of that and the impacts of, of what that does with our, our public assistance programs, or we can actually try to work and come up with programs to make sure that there's appropriate services in the community to make sure that if people have uh, entered into that stage of life that where they need some assistance, we can get them enrolled and properly trained and, and turn them into uh, citizens that can actually produce things and they can actually be dependent on themselves and be able to make generational change. So that's something where I'm really reaching out to all the municipalities to see if there's a desire uh, to put together a stakeholder group to really try to tackle these particular issues. Because again, we're approaching these things in a lot of different uh, groups right now, 
but they all have to be linked together uh, because we have so many nonprofits in this community that do fantastic things in this community, but we still, we still are operating in stovepipes. And what we need is to be able to link all these things together and come up with some strategic objectives on how we are actually going to be able to do that. So that's something I'm throwing out there for discussion. And again, this is, it's wide open. We can talk about anything. But if there's people that are wanting to participate in that, please let me know. Uh, as to the issue of homelessness, I would suggest that that already exists. Um, is the CARE Coalition, is that the name? Continuum of care, yeah. Um, uh, virtually every nonprofit involved is at the table, um, and uh, they've been working at it very hard. Uh, they're very knowledgeable, uh, and I think anything we do would be very, very dupl duplicative. Uh, on other issues, I'd, I'd be really open, uh, but um, the Care Coalition's been at it a long time. I think right now they're going through a transition with, I think they're moving leadership from United Way uh, to some other uh, designated agency. Uh, but uh, this is an outfit that uh, I think has a very comprehensive approach and I wouldn't want to suggest to them that we don't recognize that. Go ahead. You know, Mr. Mayor, I, uh, Tom Strand, City Council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I agree with what you're saying about that group. I've attended many of their meetings. I, I think they've been in, in a, a transition period. But I am concerned, uh, Commissioner Glenn brings up this, and I'm talking about homelessness in particular. You, you mentioned, I think, three or four issues, Commissioner Glenn. But I am worried about the fact that I get a dozen emails, phone calls, postcards a week about our citizenry who doesn't think the government is involved to the degree they would like us involved in this. And as we go in and, and people are shuttled, uh, that, that'll be my word, from one area to the, to the next, uh, it seems like we could be more effective if we had a regionalization or a regional approach to this. If, if they're in the city or even on utilities property and then they move to the county, uh, I don't know that we're solving anything unless somehow we can hold hands in that effort to ensure that, you know, uh, whether uh, they're in Fountain or, you know, or move to Manitou or move to Monument even, uh, how do we do, how do we work together to solve a problem where it looks like there is a nomad uh, group of camps and areas that we never seem to get our arms around and we never seem to solve and the citizens hold us accountable for the, the lack of a solution and I think they should. Well, uh, they may hold us accountable, but they uh, need to um, they need to understand what the law is, and you're a lawyer, and you know what the limitations are. I, I, I analyze uh, what people are complaining about. Tom, they want us to arrest the people that are panhandling on street corners. They want us to arrest the people that are uh, uh, camping. Right. They want us to arrest them. They want us to put them on buses and ship them out of town. We can't do any of those things. Absolutely. All we can do, uh, I think the police department, uh, I do think we've got a state-of-the-art hot team. Uh, and and you know what we arrived as a city is we'll move them out of um, of a campground as long as we can offer them a shelter bed. That seems eminently reasonable, and there's some uh, implications in some court decisions that you can't you can't take them off public property if you can't offer them something uh, something else. Now we do. Uh, they're barred from any park land. Uh, they're barred from private property by trespass laws and things like that. So, I mean, uh, um, there's been an incredible amount of thought put into this, an awful lot of communication between the police department, fire departments were, uh, working with arson issues all the time, and um, I, you are not going to bring any new thinking to the table. That's my... Uh, personal opinion. I think if we, maybe we ought to have more, I think the answer might be to have more public officials go to those meetings, because there's not an issue that you can think of that they haven't been talking about. Okay. Just real briefly, so you talked about um, buying a bus tickets. So I was in touch with the Office of Emergency Management uh, in Los Angeles, and it seems they have 47,000 homeless people out there. So I offered for us to contribute to their population. They would love the weather so much better out there. And I, they will never notice a few thousand more people. 
Okay. <laughs> well, that's one no, idea. I was going to say. <clears throat> Uh, Hard to follow that, huh? Uh, well, no, uh, actually. <laughs> but what I was going to say is I was going to say right per before you did, Mayor Southers, that uh, I think more elected officials need to be at those meetings. Since I've been mayor, I've reached out to the continuum of care probably five to ten times and have heard nothing. Several of our members in our community have tried to work with them and have gotten nowhere. So maybe, maybe we could just do both. If we could have the stakeholder group, I think is a really good idea. We could get Mayor Levy or one of his reps, right, Woodland Park, uh, Green Mountain Falls, because you're right, it does just circulate. We're all dealing with the same thing. So maybe if, if that, and you're right, we can't do some of the things our constituents are asking us to do. But if we do know what we can, it, maybe it's a matter of education or information, dissemination, whatever it is, I think a stakeholder group is a really good idea, similar to the gap, showing some skin in the game. If we're all at the same table and willing to show up for some of this stuff, I would absolutely be in favor and be willing to sit on that team. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, we're forming that new oh, like criminal Hawaii. justice uh, committee sort of region wide. It was actually the sheriff's office, and I was going to ask, does the sheriff's office show up to the CARE Coalition? I don't know. They're the ones who brought up the fact, if you look across the country, even some of our largest mental institutions today are unfortunately jails uh, across the country. So they, they know that they're being overwhelmed, and it isn't the solution uh, to, the, to the issue. Uh, in fact, it probably uh, adds to it. And there's a multi-layer of a lot of issues here, and that's why it's good that there is a... Uh, I think a group-wide discussion of it, but there it was their representative to that task force as we were talking about some of the issues that said that they're seeing that when one municipality comes up with a solution, it just pushes uh, the homeless issue over into other other jurisdictions, and that's why they were asking the question: Is there something we can do on a regional basis? And it is. I mean, you've got you've got people who uh, there, there is the marijuana that we've mentioned, but there are people who are just down and out. There are people with mental health issues. There's uh, actually uh, the veteran population, and I know that the city has stepped up, and, the, uh, and I agree that Colorado Springs Police Department has the model. I think the sheriff's office is now talking about trying to put together a similar model, um, but that, again, is we have some silos, but I'm not sure we have uh, a regional solution to it, and it does impact, certainly for the sheriff, it impacts their jail. Please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Stan Vanderwerf, El Paso County Commissioner. Uh, one of the uh, areas that I'm working in is uh, the Community Service Block Grant Program, and uh, this is a program that uh, has dollars available for people involved in homeless issues. Uh, the, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a federal pass-through program, and there's a nine set of criteria that the federal government allows you to allocate money against. In the past, they've been allocating this against emergency services and self-sufficiency, but it has turned out about 80% of that funding has been going to the private sector under contract to nonprofits dealing with emergency services, and that, frankly, is a tactical answer, not a strategic answer. So uh, one of the things we're working on doing in that block grant program is uh, trying to try something different. This is the trying to deal with the definition of insanity from Einstein. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to get the same result. So uh, we're going to try to flip those numbers uh, and uh, try to get about 80% of that federal pass-through money going into self-sufficiency and that uh, advisory committee, which has not come to the board yet for approval, this is still going on inside the advisory committee, has added a third category called employment. The idea is if we can figure out how to help people who are homeless get employed, uh, they, this gives them the vehicle and the means for them to become self-sufficient. And some of the research that I've been doing, and it's hard to really know what the numbers are, but it looks like there's about 500 people in our community that are chronically homeless, suffering from mental illness or, or addiction and so forth. And there's about another thousand that cycle in and out of homeless, and they are just down on their luck, lost their job, didn't do a good job about holding on to savings, or couldn't figure out how to hold on to savings because they weren't making enough money. And they, they, they drop into homelessness and they're self-motivated to get out. So with, with that group of 1,000, give or take, it's hard to know exactly what the number is. I'm going to use that as the number. There's a cycle time when they go into homelessness and when they come back out. I don't know what that cycle time is, but let's say it's six months or so. If we can work on a process 
to increase the speed of that cycle time, a faster interaction with the Pikes Peak Workforce Center or some other set of processes, we would actually reduce the number of people that move in and out of homelessness. Um, now that has to be the group that's self-motivated to get out uh, because uh, they typically are employable, they just have the wrong job skills and they need uh, something about you know, improving job skills or changing job skills. So I think there really is still room for action and scope for action that's a little bit different uh, than maybe what we've been trying as a community before. And we are trying to do this. The idea of flipping that 80-20 and, and doing, putting a lot more of the investment into employment and self-sufficiency is about bringing these folks who are in a homeless condition up to a place where they are employable and then getting them involved in the Pikes Peak Workforce Center where the Pikes Peak Workforce Center can actually push them into a job. And the, uh, the Workforce Center does keep good statistics about job placements as well as whether or not they've retained that job six months later. So those are good statistics that we can work with. So those are the, some of the things that we're working on with the block grant program. And, and uh, the piece that we're not talking about is the housing piece and all this. And, and, and that's the part I think we can really try to make a difference. Uh, I know our city council is really interested in looking at all of our codes. Uh, we're looking at what incentives we can put in place through utilities. We can, we, you know, the, the issue, uh, Stan, and that's a really, really good uh, point you made, is people have jo need to get jobs. But the other side of that is that they don't have a place to live. Uh, that they can afford. You know, the average two-bedroom apartment in Colorado Springs is, what, $860. It's just not easy to, and a lot of people really are that mortgage payment away or a paycheck away from, you know, lose, losing their heart, their home or their apartment. There's waiting lists, of, you know, of, of uh, many, many thousands for all the affordable housing that's out there. And so I would love to see us look at that as well. I'm speaking for David Geisinger. He's not here today, but he's he's really passionate about it too. But I think we need to look at how we can increase the affordable housing stock in a way that the market would drive it. All right. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So just to piggyback on that, we just recently created the Housing Advisory Board in Manchu Springs, the official city board. So we're hoping that um, we'll have more affordable housing as well. Um, that did come out in our master plan as something that we need and as an important um, um, goal for us, an action item. Mr. May also asked, um, he was curious what some municipalities are doing around the homeless issue. Um, granted, one of the things that we're doing is quite slow, but I will say that I think it's an important element and um, approach. We have an organization called Poetry and Pottery, and this is a, it's a nonprofit, and they came to the city and they said, you know, you guys want to work on connecting with folks who are experiencing homelessness and the transients on the streets, you know, you should give us some money. So we voted and we said, well, we'll give you some money. So they set up every Wednesday in Soda Springs Park in the pavilion, which is another place we had a lot of issues with some crime and plenty of drug use. And so we thought, well, we'll just infiltrate it with something positive, right? And so they do, um, we have one of our firefighters uh, is also a potter, Mark Wong. If you don't know him, he's amazing. And he does pottery. He brings out a wheel and does pottery with anybody who wants to. And then Molly Wingate um, does poetry and does writing. So it's it's actually really amazing. We had two of our police officers came out. It was hilarious because they recreated the scene from Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have it on video. It is, it is so good. <clears throat> I'll use it at some point, I'm sure. With the song so, in the background, right? <laughs> yes. Right. Well, they sang it. Somebody oh, sang it. <laughs> so anyway, Unchained my point melody. is, yeah. Yeah. my point is sometimes, you know, it is definitely about housing, and I'm all in favor of that and everything else that you guys are talking about. Um, but sometimes, too, it's just that small piece that gets the community buy-in as well. Uh, so we have a lot of local folks that show up, and then we have tourists in the park who see this. They have no idea what the reasoning is behind it, but they love it. And they come over and they do it, right? And they get a pot to take home. A ceramic pot <laughs> to take home. <laughs> <laughs> Made out of clay. Yolanda, I am so sorry. I've been horrible about this. This is Nicole Nicoletta from Manitou Springs. You I'm have so been. sorry. I have been. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate so, the affirmation. I, poor Dan May, I'm like, who's speaking? Who's speaking? Who's speaking? And I know you may get tired of hearing it, but it's really, 
I really want to know who's talking. So I know the mayor when he's talking. I also know all the other city council members, but the others I haven't, I haven't, oh, Lonquinos for sure, but I have the rest of you, I'm sorry, but I don't recognize your voices. Give me some time. By next year, I'll recognize all your voices. <laughs> so please, please say your name before you talk. Uh, city Council, you're off the hook, and Mayor. <laughs> I told her I was more than happy to help out a fellow Mitchell grad. <laughs> so I just had, I'm sorry, John, one more thing. Uh, yeah. If it's okay, just to follow up on Mr. May's question. Nicole Nicoletta, by the way, <laughs> Mandrew Springs. I still did it. Oh my gosh, that's so bad. Um, we also have a, a very aggressive plan. It's the LEAP program that our um, police chief put together for um, going up to the homeless camps because as we definitely saw last year with the Forest Service, it really was. We were all just sharing each other's problem, right? So we have a great program in place and that uses Keep Color Springs Beautiful to yeah. help. And we also, our uh, Judge Thrasher does our municipal court who's amazing. Um, he allows anyone who comes in there who wants to do community service can do it with Keep Color Springs Beautiful and they can be part of cleaning up potentially a mess that they made. It may not be theirs, but um, so some of those efforts too, I think make a big difference trying to keep it as, um, as um, I guess just as local and, and personal, like you said, social detox, I think was a word you used. I was never heard that, it's cool. So anyway, those were a couple things that we're doing. Uh, I think there's um, real opportunities for regional discussion about uh, innovative ways to approach uh, housing because the reality is I think we're going to see a, a cons and I don't care who's running the White House, I think you're going to see a consistently declining HUD funding of local um, uh, affordable housing efforts. And that's going to lead us, um, you know, the vast majority of governments, as, as you point out, Daryl, are not going to get into the business. Uh, we're left with uh, being a facilitator and to some extent an incentivizer because um, uh, there's a, a structure that's in place uh, tax incentive wise and some incentives through the state of Colorado uh, that incentivize people to get uh, to build affordable housing you know and offer 60% housing for a period of time or 40% um, uh, rent uh, for for a, a period of time and I think it's incumbent upon all of us regionally to think uh, about how our respective communities can contribute to that. One of the things that I personally uh, would not like to see is kind of a ghettoizing of affordable housing. I think we're the type of community that can avoid that and still have uh, a significant amount of uh, affordable housing. And, and this it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, the city's got an issue, and uh, I don't want to get into much detail because these guys have to probably deliberate on it. Uh, but, you know, the, the neighborhood opposition to some of this stuff is pretty substantial, uh, and it's going to be incumbent upon us uh, to make sure that um, when we're uh, evaluating opposition that it's based on parking, it's based on access, and not just you know, uh, gee, I live a half a mile from this and my $750,000 house may be uh, impacted. Uh, and it's going to be easier said than done. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Stan Vanderwerf, El Paso County Commissioner. Hopefully soon, Avila, you'll recognize my voice. So, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> uh, in responding to uh, Councilman Scorman's comment with regard to housing, uh, one of the things that we've just uh, initiated uh, in the county, and of course we've got a long way to go, uh, is uh, building code implementation, building, building and use code implementation for tiny homes. So um, may, maybe many of you know, but maybe some don't know, we're actually one of the if I understand it correctly, we're one of the largest, uh, the Colorado Springs area is one of the largest manufacturers of tiny homes, and it's a little bit ridiculous to not really make the maximum use of these kinds of structures when we actually have an economic base 
a manufacturing base for it. So um, I think I'm not sure if the, the city may be uh, considering or already into something along those lines, but I can tell you that we have initiated that here. I would concur with the mayor. I don't think it's going to be easy to get through that because there's a lot of unplowed ground with regard to going there. But these homes, the more expensive ones are in the range of $60,000 or something like that. They're, and that just puts you in a place where a lot more people might be able to, afford their, to afford, a, afford a home. It'll be a small home, but it'll be a home that uh, they would be able to afford. So we're, we're going down that path, and maybe there is a component of cooperation there that might be interesting. What we are going through as far as what we think would be a right approach and what the city might be going through as far as what they think might be a right approach. And maybe we can um, go a little faster because we uh, cooperate on, on those points. No, and, and that's great. Uh, thank you for taking the lead on that. And I, w I would love to learn more, learn from your uh, experience about how this is going. I think our city council would be very interested in that. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of wrapping that issue up, so we will reach out to people that want to kind of participate in a strategic level think tank on how we want to do that. But I think we should probably get close to wrapping up. If there are any closing comments that we can go around the table or just if anybody wants to raise their hand or any, even in the audience, I, I want to personally say thank you for taking the time. I mean, it's hard to get um, schedules coordinated to spend three hours to talk about these issues, but I think it's extremely uh, important that we do that and we lay out a strategic vision on how we can work together uh, because it, it's it's so important and it's I truly appreciate you spending the time here so any last minute comments please thank, thank you, you. <laughs> she said, oh Sharon, Sharon. Nicole. Sharon Thompson, Fountain City Council. One of the things that's important um, down in Fountain is accessibility to county services. And I know we've met with Henry recently, and I really appreciate all the time his departments. Um, and I'm sure Manitou probably struggles with this also, about getting people to the services that you need. Um, and with transportation issues, uh, we're looking at people that are riding the bus four to five hours with two to three kids to get up to the county offices to get an EBT card. I understand they can be mailed, but um, I've talked to some agencies, and, and that's just unrealistic for a lot of people who may not even live at the home, the address they get, um, the, where their card gets taken, you know, and so, or somebody else uses it before they even have access to it. So I just think we really need to think about the southeast part of the county, and um, especially the city of Fountain, getting some type of c more community services down there. Um, we have a lot of people down there that are needing them. According to the last county census, we have two, com we have two communities that are the poorest in the county, lowest income. And um, I don't know about you guys, but how much you ride the buses, but um, I unfortunately don't have to ride the bus to do that. But I would not want to try to do a stroller and a diaper bag and hungry kids and somebody not feeling well and have to ride the bus from Fountain, Pikes Peak Community College, transfer onto Mountain Metro, have to go to downtown to transfer to another bus to get to county services. And then you're an hour late and you missed your appointment with your counselor. And I think it's something that we just really, really need to look at is um, really better services. Probably uh, Yolanda could probably kind of um, for her into town too. But um, it's just, there's just this one glitch that we really need to to work on. Um, I don't think you'd want to spend the whole day. And, and it, it comes down to also our elderly population too. Um, access to services for them too, spending that amount of time. If you have a walker or, you know, things you need to carry with you, access to the restroom and things, trying to get to, to services. So I would just like to see that something we continue. I know it's going to be a problem. Can't address it and answer it today. But if we don't keep it on the table and be the squeaky wheel, we're, we're going to be squeaking this year. So. Thanks. Uh, Peggy Littleton. Sharon, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that just this month the um, health department signed a lease on a facility down further south. It's not down in Fountain yet, but uh, it's certainly around um, Academy and Fountain around in that area. But which Still, is, they would have to ride the buses up to Pikes Peak well, Community College and go up to town and right. then ride the bus back down and then just, yeah. Right. Unless, <laughs> and that's, that, would my, that was my next thing, you know, maybe we can work, work with PPRTA and work with the city to align 
line of bus that went from, you know, Fountain and that area directly to, you know, on that route over there that would make it much easier for them. So we can align some of the services, hopefully, because I think that that is going to have a bunch of different services within it. Um, Department of Human Services, uh, Department of Health, uh, a little bit of, I don't know if the clerk and recorder is going to go there or not, but certainly we need to take all that into consideration. Good point. Yolanda, I'll give you the last, and then we will, we can break, we can adjourn, and then if there's people that want to have some private discussions, we can do that. Okay, Sharon, thank you so much. Um, I need a partner in that. Uh, when there's accessibility and there's transportation for people with disabilities, it's for everybody. Like you said, the mother with strollers. I ride the bus, I ride the fixed route, I ride metro, I ride taxis, I ride Lyft, I ride Uber. Richard Scorman gives me rides. <laughs> I, uh, I walk a lot. So it is so important, not only you know, just to get to services, but to get to jobs, to get to medical appointments, to be a real part of the community. And it's true, the Southeast is overlooked um, because maybe the voting um, population isn't there, so we really don't have to listen, right? So I really appreciate that uh, those comments, and it. I'm. You guys are going to get tired of hearing this, but I am. Until something happens with transit, and our bridges, crumbling bridges, get fixed, and our roads, I'm not going to shut up. So I really am asking all of you for your support because when the southeast is strong, the rest of the county, the rest of the city, is strong. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to officially adjourn, but invite anybody that wants to stick around and make friends to do that. But again, thank you very much for attending.